Brussels, right? Some's ahead of an A, some's at Brussels. Charles Fatton is in Ukraine. So, for Charles, the question of rescue efforts, how are they proceeding? Well, what they get it at? Civilization season. Every time we talk about and Zizi, those are the river. Good afternoon. Welcome to another session of the Miles Seminar. Um, today is special. We have a book launch by uh, Dr. Andrea Casatella. The book is uh, called Beyond the Secular. Jackie Derrida and the Theological Political Complex. Uh, Dr. Cassatella is not uh, new to our faces. He's known to us. He's a senior research fellow at Miser. Um, he's convening courses in colonialism and, and you know and culture. And uh, today we've organized the support cast for this launch. We have uh, Joseph Sintayevo Jamberi, who is a Miser PhD candidate, will be joining us, will be joining us online. We have Professor Silvana Parotenuto from uh, the Department of Human and Social Sciences in Naples, Italy, is a professor of postcolonial literature. We have our own uh, Dr. Jacob Katumusim, who is now a postdoctoral fellow at Miser. We have uh, Dr. Yasser Yahya Seremba, who is a research fellow at Miser. And we shall also have uh, Associate Professor Jimmy Spire Sentongo, uh, who is from uh, uh, Ghana Matters in Makerere and uh, a topical commentator on uh, social issues in Uganda, will also be giving us uh, a discussion of uh, Dr. Kasatila's book. Um, <coughs> Dr. Kasatila, you will have 40 minutes to give us the thrust of the book. And then we'll be inviting uh, you know, further discussions after that. And then after the back and forth is done, we shall have uh, interactions with the audience. Uh, you are welcome to give your, you know, your thrust. And we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Much of the Kisule, it's nice to be on the other side of the fence. <laughs> uh, and it's really a pleasure to, to be presenting this book here, uh, also because part of it has been subject to criticism originally from my community. Uh, when I applied for the job here, I wanted the chapter of democracy, I think, and the chapter of Islam was also presented here. So I look forward to the full uh, exposure and the reaction to. So it took me a bit of time to think about how would I present this book in mind. But I should have made the reason for it. So let's see what um, So the focus of the book seems to be the relation between religion and politics. But as I, I'll try to demonstrate, the book is not simply about the relation between religion and politics. It is a methodological book about how we think uh, the way we approach reality and how we enter. So more specifically, the book interrogates the foundation of modern secular discourse, and illuminate secularism and tumbling with the legacy of colonialism and race, and, and exposes the racial features of secular understanding of language, epistemology, religion, and politics, who travels worldwide through processes of globalization. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to give you a little bit about the context, the context of reference, the empirical context that I've been through this method. A brief reference to why, why that is and the, uh, uh, the overall take of that on this method. And then I'd like to connect the two parts of the book, which are not really two parts, but they, they, they correspond to the division that is actually made. I thought that apparently at an early, an early moment that more philosophical, and so the first two chapters are on language and time and epistemology, and the later part of this career were more political. But if you have the chance to read the book, you will see that the, the four themes, language, epistemology, and history, uh, uh, 
politics and religion, they run through all the all the things in, 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 in Islam. Uh, so in the la last part, I try to connect with the, 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 the first and the second part. So the context, the context is what literature has uh, identified as some 30 years ago, the so-called return of religion. But, well, it has started 30 years ago in a more pronounced manner uh, as, as, as grasped by media and, and academic discourse. The so-called return of religion, as if religion was ever gone from the public sphere. But idea you can think of, you know, my, in the book I start with uh, referencing the wars that in, in Yugoslavia in the 90s, 9-11, uh, the response to 9-11, uh, the, the growing influence of Western Muslimism in South America, Asia, the states, states, the violence against Muslim in Asia, uh, Myanmar, India. Today, uh, so, I, so we can multiply the example in which religion is very much part of the public sphere and is often associated with violence. And so, now what is the problem with that? So the problem, as I understand it, is I call it theological political, and the idea is how the relationship between religion and politics is implicated in the foundation of knowledge, political authority, and community. Now, when we look at this method, uh, thinking about modern secular discourse is key. Now, modern secular discourse is not simply the conceptual framework within which we, in a way, always operate or take distance from, but that's, that's out there. But it's also the theoretical framework informing modern uh, institutions such as the nation state, international law and politics, and also informs very much sensibility of how what is acceptable as being political in public, so sensibility about public morality. Key to this uh, uh, discourse are, are four concepts that I want just to flag. The idea of the secular, because of, of their genealogies, is complex and, and, and seem to be removed from religion, but very, is very much part of this of, of, of religion itself. So the secular is an epistemic category that refers to a, 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 the possibility of recording to one space that is, is free from religion. Secularization is a, is a sort of historical and sociological theory that talks about the progressiveness, the differentiation of the religious sphere from other sphere, political, economic, scientific, uh, and it's often associated to uh, Max Weber and, and, and his followers. And then we have secularism, that is a normative category. Uh, the proper relationship between religion and politics, meaning that in modern time, these two have to be separated in order to guarantee tolerance, freedom, and development. But the most, cate the most important category of all, perhaps, is the category of religion, without which, not simply these other categories, conceptual categories, don't function, but modern institutions don't function. Because in the embodiment of minority rights, the rights of religion, there is the very idea of religion. This idea of religion is considered as a generic term that in fact is connected to a particular uh, uh, historical uh, time and tradition, we say the, the Christian tradition, and is fundamentally conceived as belief, hence the, the belief. one of the first human rights that's the human consciousness. Now, the persistence of religion, though, challenges all this discourse that is fundamentally premised on the separation of religion and politics. And so, rather than thinking about return of religion, which presupposes, in fact, the, the very uh, theories that it challenges, because this secularization, secularism talk about the separation, and the, the progressive uh, the decline in privatization of religion. But if religion is out there, then how, how can we think about it as a return? So I reconceptualize the problem as theological political compass. I borrow from Spinoza the idea of theological political, because Spinoza in early modern time was one of the, the, the most insistent on, on being cautious in separating uh, the, the two. Uh, 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 and complexity had uh, two, two understanding here. On the one hand is that the, the relationship between uh, uh, religion and politics in modern times is over determined. So basically it's not simply ubiquitous, it's almost everywhere, precisely because uh, the expansion of the nation state, international politics are secular, not to mention also economic institutions. But also because why we, when we start reflecting on the secular, the secular is already there. And so it's already pre-reflecting. So there is a sense in which it's very difficult to get outside of the second, if, if, if at all. The second connotation of the complex is the idea that there is a complex genealogy between race, religion, and colonialism that scholars and anthropology scholars of post-colonialism have pointed to. 
So why to study the theological political context that appears now, it seems to me, in, in, in the philosophical urgency of trying to figure out a different uh, way to look at, 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 at social social phenomena uh, uh, um, away from the, the, the separatist uh, paradigm? Uh, why to look through it, uh, uh, at it through the lenses of my days? Now, for me, the encounter with Derrida was accidental, but I found, I think, resources to think through, through these matters. Uh, um, now, there is no doubt that Derrida, if one wants to take a, 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 There seems seem to have been a problem with the sound, sound but right. now things are fine. So, so there, there is, is no doubt that Derrida has focused on focus the Western tradition, but I want to resist the European appropriation of, of his thought. There is a Zoven associated to structuralism, has insisted that his interest in structure, and has spent a lot of time in criticizing structure, but his interest in structure. He is never, and he's also associated to postmodernism, he has never questioned the idea of truth. And you know, this is the landmark of postmodernism. So, what I, what I think is key for, for my project is the theoretical relevance of his biography and how his biography influences his lived experience of being at the margin of Europe uh, in, the in the Mediterranean, but also in Africa uh, as an Arab Jew. An Arab Jew which, which is today, today is a conceptual, conceptual and political possibility if you think about what, what's happening in, in Israel and, and Palestine. And so, and so Derrida has insisted that he has uh, uh, sustained a fidelity to more than one identity. And he has identified himself as African, Black, Arab Jew, Franco Magribian of Algerian heritage. And so, and so these, these elements are, are, are present, this is my claim, in the way he, 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 in, in the way he understood the world, first of all, in the way he proceeds in articulating his, his philosophical intervention. Uh, some, some scholars have evidently described Derrida as an African thinker, some other as an Islamic thinker, thinker similar to Ibn Arabic, uh, for his anti-systematic approach to interpretation, and, uh, and especially the interpretation of sacred text. So, so I understand, I understand this, this, this the experience as a, of, as a form of systemic, systemic resistance. resistance. Derrida talks, talks about exemplarity as a, as a, as a, as a way of, as a philosophical mode of witnessing. It's basically talking about uh, uh, a part, starting from a particular situation and being cog uh, cognizant of a particular situation or, or context and using it as a ground for talking about something of more general reach, which doesn't mean uh, 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 that this will, will have universal validity. Universal value and universal validity are two different things. And so the experience of the margin never becomes a privileged access to uh, 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 something either outside modernity or that uh, give uh, an epistemic advantage, if not only uh, 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 we can consider it for its critical positioning. It seems to me to be similar to elements of the colonial library. Actually, the colonial library seems to be unthinkable in terms of uh, the contamination. The colonial library uh, talked about by Mudimbe, but also Orientalism uh, uh, in Said. The early text of Derrida uh, happened in the 1960s. So what, what is the argument of the book? So as, as the title suggests that uh, Derrida offered the resources to go beyond the secular. And by secular, I mean uh, a discourse that imposes the separation between religion and politics. It is grounded in a worldview that consider the only possibility of knowledge to be knowledge to be secular. Anything that is not secular cannot count as knowledge. Uh, but also uh, uh, a, concept, a fundamental conception uh, at, at, at the core of, of human rights protection is the individual as an autonomous individual. And uh, uh, um, finally, the idea that uh, the possibility of being political excludes the possibility of being religious at the same time. So what Derrida does, he uh, uh, questions the opposition of modern logic that separate religion and politics and expose racialized, <laughs> sexualized, and uh, a religious based presupposition. And the role they play in generating discriminatory hierarchies and practice. Derrida, an alternative, articulate a relational account uh, uh, that resists the translation of the theological into the political. I, I will talk a little bit about this and open the space for different grammars to emerge uh, 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 or to join forces of, of other, other political grammars. And I explore, unlike many critics, uh, 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 the possibility that Islam for Derrida, or at least in the logic of his argument, is another name for thinking religion as addressing social and political phenomena. So what is key for my argument is the hyphenation between the theological and the political. And the hyphenation is both a point to 
an element of relationality and its historicity. And so the, the, the relationship between the two is historical and relational. Uh, so what Derrida does, in my understanding, he radicalizes the interconnection, but at the same time reflect on the distinction between the theological and the political. Uh, um, in how this relation is involved in the foundation of modern uh, epistemic and political orders. So in pursuing this, this argument, I'm not claiming that Derrida was at the forefront of discourse about sexuality, feminism, race, so on and so forth, but that he has a profound awareness that how they intersect in the structural epistemic grid through which to look at the world. In fact, in my take at the very beginning of the book, I'm critical of the, uh, Derrida lack of engagement, for instance, so with, with the feminism or with anything else than uh, European males authors, uh, or uh, not having explored further the question of race. And but I think the issue is there. It is there from a philosophical understanding. To it. So the, the, the type of literature I was interested in intervening in uh, uh, directly were uh, two literatures. The first one is uh, a literature on political theology. Political theology is a broad, broad uh, field that basically it can be considered both ancient and modern. In the modern form is the idea that modern political categories are, are framed on the, on the same structural terms as theological categories. Uh, in, in the earlier time, we can think of Augustine, we can think of the entire Islamic tradition is about the, the connection, the inseparability, in fact, of thinking about religion and politics or reason and faith. Uh, the other, the other uh, 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 literature is the literature on secularism, not simply in the liberal camp, but also in some, in some other camp uh, of uh, uh, India, particularly Rajit Barjava, or uh, some Muslim thinkers that they think that the secular is key in order to address the problem of difference in their context. I think that I, I indirectly, and as I try to show in the later chapter, Derrida talks about a reconceptualization of how we think about identity and difference and the very possibility of political community beyond the nation. So let me, let me say a few things about how Derrida understand the question of religion. Now, what, what is the religion? What is the difference between religion and religious phenomena? So as many as a scholar of religion, uh, uh, Derrida identify the category of religion as having a, a Christian, particularly a Latin origin, and being implicated in, 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 the, in the entire conceptual uh, uh, tradition, Western tradition, modern tradition, and it's also an institutional function. And so for Derrida, uh, uh, the idea of, of religion in modern time is a form of global, globalization that he calls global Latinization. It goes back to the Latin origin of the category of religion. And so globalization for him is uh, the uh, worldwide extension of the juridical political culture of Christianity through the sovereignty of the nation state, citizenship and international law, and of course supported by material processes of expropriation and exploitation. Derrida is very clear in saying that it's originally European and colonial, and then becomes part of American imperialism. So issues of race and colonialism are part of the project from the get-go. He offers a different, uh, a different entry to understand the category of religion based on his own experience, and he used this category of the Abrahamic, which is a bit fuzzy category. But the idea is this one, that by using the category of the Abrahamic, is, is able to see what were the relationship between Christianity Islam and Judaism at the very formation of modernity. Because this is very difficult to do in modern time because the category of religion filters the way in which you can understand religious difference. And so by using the category of Abrahamic is able to, to, to look at what sort of a, a, a relationship of power there were between the, the three. And in fact, uh, Christianity is dominating, uh, 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 Judaism, the interior excluded other or for those who were not expelled in North Africa and Islam as the, what Carl Schmitt has identified as the enemy of the political, so completely outside. Uh, there are, it, the Muslim that are left, that are in Europe are not left in Europe, there are only those who immigrated. And so there was an ethnic cleansing, as, as you all know from also the work of, of Professor Mamdani. So, although it's a specific category, it opens up the possibility of seeing what religious difference is beyond the category of religion. So, the, the fundamental problem uh, uh, for Derrida about the, the modern discourse of religion is that it's, it's characterized by a separatist logic that I already mentioned, but also a hierarchizing one that considers the secular domain as severed from, but also epistemically superior and therefore politically justified to rule not simply over religion, but to rule over difference. The question of difference, how the question of difference is negotiated 
is through the relation to tyrannism and politics in early, in, in early modernity. And that has, has been essential to the, to, to the way in, this, in, in which this category of travel to the so-called discover the new world, the way they've been applied, in fact, to, to, to slavery and to the rest of, of uh, the, 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 what would become the colonial world with the expansion of, of, of the colonial nation state. Now, what is the unity or what is the basis to guarantee the stability of this distinction? Now, for Derrida, there is a cultural and philosophical problem connected with this that is supported by, by, by politics and, and, material, and material forces. And the, 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 the philosophical problem here is that is, is what he calls metaphysics of presence. He takes it from Heidegger, but the idea is this, that you, you, can, uh, you can grasp the essence of, of reality immediately, meaning independently of or beyond the condition within which you are based and within which it appears. And this allows to establish fundamental distinction that have characterized the entire philosophical uh, tradition, such as intelligible and sensible, nature and culture, very important distinction, transcendental and empirical, but also religion and politics. So it is a form of pure unmediated uh, uh, thinking. Now, the problem with this thinking is that it's racial. Derrida calls it white mythology. For, those, for all those who think that he's a European thinker. Uh, uh, so I want to read a passage uh, quickly in 1971 from this uh, essay called White Mythologies. He says, metaphysics, the white mythology which resembles and reflects the culture of the West. The white man takes on his own mythology, the Indo-European mythology, his own logos, that is the mythos of his reason for the universal form that he must still wish to call reason, which does not go uncontested. White mythology, metaphysics, has erased within itself the fabulous scene that has produced it. The inscribed in white ink, an invisible design cover over in the palimpsest. So the, the, the fundamental characteristic for Derrida of, of this understanding is that it has a racial connotation. And I, here I take race basically as a sort of a historical construct based on epistemological and moral uh, uh, hierarchies that grounds political uh, uh, arrangement. So white mythology here names a logic and process of naturalization of a particular life form that is established at the level of universal nationality, but it is contested, and uh, uh, strategies of hiding the relationality of human existence, but also uh, uh, that other elements were excluded. And not mentioned in this essay by throughout his work are colonialism, secularism, and capitalism. And, and although Derrida never, never directly spoke about race, in, before dying in uh, 2003, participated in a conference on race, and he said that deconstruction is fundamentally the deconstruction of racism. Because deconstruction, by unsettling the possibility of stable distinction, unsettled the distinction between nature and culture on the basis of which all naturalization are based, and on the basis of which things can be translated into a univocal universal standard. So my contribution here is to connect his critique of philosophy uh, 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 with the idea of, of white mythology on the one hand to the modern discourse of religion. Uh, and this uh, uh, creates, I think, a powerful account of the racial underlying, undercurrent racial feature uh, uh, of, of uh, 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 modern secular discourse. So on the one hand, we have a, 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 a philosophical uh, 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 desire and, and uh, attempt to, to, to rescue origins, basically essences, and this is what the, uh, the, the discourse of race does. Uh, 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 seeks for purity and essences and on the basis set separation. If you think about the etymology of apartheid mean, means setting apart. Uh, but also I, I suggest that, that this logic is very much present in, in, in secularism. Secularism is, is, uh, relies on a pure understanding of religion. It relies on a separation and hierarchy between reason and faith. Uh, in a clear cut distinction between what is political and what is not political, but also it hides the condition of the formation of what they call secular reason, secular liberal democracy, so on and so forth, which is again uh, the, the element that I mentioned in colonialism and, and, and uh, capitalism fundamentally. So I think the importance and radicality of what he, what he says what, with white mythology is that it points to the unconscious of racial thinking. Racial thinking is not of any particular group. Right? And so I understand this as the epistemic possibility, believing that it's possible to rescue origin and naturalize them in a political desirability of, of creating separation. Now, I think that this is at work in all understanding of nation, ethnicity, tribes, or, or, or uh, religion as a form of identity in, in modern time. And I think that this idea that you can grasp uh, uh, what the object you're looking at is also very relevant for, for some of the work uh, 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 you all do here when you look at the pre-colonial 
you go and you look at the pre-colonial, if you, if you grasp the pre-colonial, what of the pre-colonial in fact are you grasping? And how are the, the conditions within which you are operating affecting the selection of the sources, how you read them, so on and so forth, so, so that you can say that is the pre-colonial. So I want to expand on the schema uh, 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 to, 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 to connect together how question of language and, 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 and secularism are connected and question of time and history are connected to, to, to democracy. It will be just a sketch and uh, uh, sometimes abstract, but please bear with me, I'll give examples. So the first one, when we think about secularism, the question of language has been invoked by secular thinkers in, in, in recent literature, uh, John Rawls, uh, Jürgen Habermas, Abdullah Hanaim, uh, to think about, uh, uh, they think of translation as the possibility, as the process through which multiple worldview are reframed in the language of, of, of secular reason uh, 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 in a neutral way, just because what is caught is cognitive content. So the example here is that if you have a religious belief that we are all equally children of God, the real truth content of this is that equality before the law. Uh, now, this, this, this view has been invoked from different corners, as I mentioned in, uh, at the beginning. And what, what was striking to me was that there has been very little attention about what is the nature of translation? What translation? What is translation? Uh, uh, um, and I think this is a fundamental, a fundamental problem of, of, of the postcolonial. colonial Insofar, the postcolonial is cut in between the modern and whatever was there before. Uh, and there's a constant translation of, let's take our, our, our the example, this context or the broader continental context of African culture, politics, economic into model forms, not simply of understanding, but also ways of living. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and where a modernist embracing of the situation and an activist one presents all self-evident problem, the question of translation, I think, has to be uh, uh, thematized in a more critical and decisive way for all the work we do, because translation is about how we determine the object of analysis. And I will, I will show you, I will speak to it in, in, in a moment. So the traditional understanding of translation in the social sciences is that it's a linguistic phenomenon. Well, uh, 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 it's rendering intelligible meaning from one language to another one. Uh, and so there is a sort of a, a computation. It's like Google Translate, right? And then you know, when you try to put on Google Translate, you see all sort of deviations from what you know is the, 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 the the, the meaning of the, 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 the something that's being put in a language that you're very, maybe it's your mother tongue or you're very familiar with. So this view of, of, of language uh, uh, presupposes a sort of transparency of language. Language just communicate how the world is, doesn't shape how the world is. Uh, and that takes a lot of issues with this. First of all, he thinks that we are, as a human condition, in a relationship of translation between each other. Because whenever somebody raised the question of a universal language, this question is raised in a language. And this language is connected to politics, history, forces, and context. And so there is no meta language as such. And if you think of any language, I'm speaking English, in English there are Latin words, Greek words, German words, French words, there is no purity in any language. You can pick any language and, and, and come with examples of that. But the most important point I think is that for him, language mediates what he renders intelligible. And so because what he renders is intelligible is affected by history and politics. This mediation uh, uh, always impede that whatever a concept name capture the reality of what it, it, it is referring to. I will give example, please bear with me. Uh, uh, uh. So by, by traversing different time and context, there's always the possibility of a differentiation of alteration of the meaning of the same concept that has been used century before. And so here is the infamous idea of difference for Derrida. And he plays with the French differer, which means to defer, or differentiate, and uh, to postpone, to defer. And so the idea here is that whenever you use a category to name anything at all, there's never a conclusive uh, 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 grasping, and there's never a conclusive relation between the word, the meaning of the word, and the object that is grasped. <laughs> this is, I think, is relevant for our research. When we say land, what do we say? When we say peasant or subaltern, what do we say? More importantly, so for, for some of, uh, of, 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 of you that are involved in conceptual history. Now, how can you trace the meaning of something that has traveled through history? And what are the forces involved in this form of interpretation? Or how do we reconstruct context? So on and so forth. So now, if these are the, the forces at place, uh, uh, then there is something, what we consider the original meaning, a meaning, a, a given meaning in a language is already unstable because this meaning is the product of forces that have excluded other understanding, right? Imagine the category of the human. 
right? Uh, 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 uh. And, and therefore there is, and it also is the category of the human is connected as an example to a particular understanding to the, to the language in which it is spoken, right? <laughs> and so there's a cultural connection to the language. And so the translation of the, of the original as an equivalent is, is, is doomed to fail from the get-go. <laughs> and so translation is always a form of, of, of transformation. Transformation uh, of the meaning uh, that comes into a translating language. I will give example, concrete example, bear with me. I, I said it many times, but I'll get to it now. The translating language ab absorbed into uh, uh, its own rules, understanding of political interest, the meaning that uh, 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 it's conducive to, to their own purposes. Now think about the, the so-called religious, uh, 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 traditional religion in, in, uh, in, in Africa. What happened with the arrival of the modern world or, or, or colonialism? What, what sort of, not simply semantic transformation, but institutional transformation have happened on the ground? Uh, another category I've been working uh, with a lot is the uh, understanding of religion in, in the Arabic tradition. Din, din cannot be reduced to a, a question of belief. It's a way, a way of living. Now, if secularization is about privatization of religion, how do we privatize a way of life without destroying it or transforming it? <laughs> so, here, the idea is that translation is always cut in, in, in an asymmetry of power and in, and in politics, and is fundamentally political. It's not simply a linguistic matter. It is political. Because what counts as law, religion, subjectivity, identity in a given context is always already the product of a translation of what counts as the proper understanding. The viators are out. And this happens in the foundation of political community. And so translation becomes a question of sovereignty. The sovereign, the, the translation is, is a form of establishing a, uni a unified semantic and juridical political space for dealing with difference, according to a framework that re reframe difference according to the secular language of the law. <laughs> so the law is always a translation. Now, what I, 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 I do in, in the book is that I show that if we maintain a secular uh, discourse proposes and some post-colonial thinkers also embrace the stability of the category of religion. To talk about the religious phenomena, uh, what we have, we have a metalinguistic criteria for shaping, transforming, and colonizing society and ordering society up, uh, according to culture-specific uh, uh, criteria. And so here, the stakes at work here uh, uh, are tied up with the hegemonic and sovereign control of the production of knowledge that is relevant to modern political life. So here is not simply about determining relevant criteria of secular representation, what counts as good democracy, so on and so forth, but also policing that only acceptable understanding are, 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 are included. The implication of this is also that, therefore is that there is, a, there is a form of profound assimilation and societal transformation. And so I've given the example of, of, of Arabic uh, uh, din, uh, religion in, in the Muslim tradition, but uh, as you, many of you know, uh, uh, what is happening in Israel in Palestine is the translation of the, of the theological into the, into the political, is that the politicization of Judaism is a form of secularization as translation that is very fundamentally connected to, to, to settler colonialism. So what is the relation between secularism and settler colonialism? Or is settler colonialism independent of secularism, secularism and secularization? So once again, the point to bring home here is that <laughs> precisely because modern public life cannot work independently of a Christian origin for a univocal understanding, a classifying and ordering of religious phenomena and difference in general. Processes of secularization as form of, of translation are processes of racialization of the knowledge and political forms that are relevant to public life. Joseph, what, uh, um, Joseph how much time do I have? 15 minutes, okay. So I want to say something uh, about, so I, here I, I talk about the connection between language and translation and secularism. Here I want to talk about the, the relationship between the understanding of time that informs an understanding of history, which informs the way in which we normally believe, think how we relate to others, and the idea of political community, particularly the democracy. Now, it might sound strange to think about why somebody should think about time when he's focusing on religion and politics, now, or political thinking. Now, the question is that, the thinking of time is always presupposed in any type of thinking that we are. Everything that we think, we think in, in time. And so 
in the Western tradition that has also influenced much of post-colonial responses uh, uh, of, the, of the nation state, uh, the, the, the view of time is a synchronic, uh, 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 synchronic understanding. Basically, it's associated to Aristotle and it, it can be traceable up to, up to Einstein. Uh, so the time is basically an infinite series of successive moments, past, present, and future, that are in a line. Right? So the, the, the idea of the line uh, represents also a form of teleology, basically a, 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 a purposive, purposive way of understanding how we progress into the future. Now, if you allow me, I just want to show, if this is time, I'm differentiating the unit, past, present, and future. And so if for Aristotle and those who, who, who come after, they think that is a, an infinite succession of different units that can be distinguished as units, the moment this you grasp this as a unit, you have stopped time. <clears throat> because the unit is attached, the past is attached to the present, the present is attached to the future. And so thinking time in this way is a metaphysical way of thinking. But but the trick here for Derrida, I mean the trick, the, 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 the graph is that at the basis of this thinking is the possibility of grasping the origin and essences. And so you can you can establish what is most fundamental, for instance, in the relation between reason and faith. It's reason that can grasp uh, uh, the essences of things. And so reason becomes justified as, 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 the, as the king in town. So <coughs> I, I can't enter into the, the, the elaborated discussion that I have in the book, but the point here is that by, the constru by associating the deconstruction of time, with the question of race, of white mythology, because this is a form of metaphysical thinking. And I said metaphysical thinking is a form of white racialized thinking. Derrida uh, destabilized the possibility of naturalization uh, that inform uh, uh, any, any form of racialized thinking at, at its very roots. Now, this, this has implication for the relationship between religion and politics, uh, particularly the idea of the theological and the political. And here I, I talked about the diaphanation if you kind of grasp an origin so that gives you a stable foundation, then you cannot separate one from the other. You cannot, you don't have justifiable reason to suppose that reason is more fundamental than faith. And this has been the discourse of, of secularism. But be careful also the other, the other, the other round, the other way is true. That applies also to the other round. So it's not that faith is more fundamental than reason. There is a, a dialectical relation that is contact, constant between the two. And the possibility of solving, in fact, is the, is the purity of, 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 of thinking that I, uh, exemplifies racial thinking, precisely because of, is, is a thinking of origin. So it also affects, and this is, uh, I think, most important for political thinking, uh, 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 the categories that have characterized the more than modern political grammars. <laughs> In the book, I talk about the sovereignty, citizenship, and political community, but particularly sovereignty. Sovereignty has been conceived in a way or on another up to democratic time as a, as a form of a, a, a temporal understanding of, of a power that is indivisible and can put itself above the law, as if it could put itself above history and then again uh, above, above time. And I, I give concrete example with uh, COVID, for instance, with Guantanamo, the, the fact of bypassing all democratic procedures is, is a form of putting yourself above the law. But also in, in approaching a uh, particular in, uh, in, in uh, uh, political theology, which is, seems to me in the thought of Carl Schmitt, exemplified the nation, the nation, uh, the nationalist thinking par excellence. Because uh, uh, Schmitt offered two forms of naturalization. First, he thinks that the sovereign for, for, for Schmitt is he who can decide on, a, on the exception, when you can suspend the law, okay? But this distinction is based on a more fundamental distinction. Of, in order to, to know what is the normality of the norm, you have to have a sense of what is the political community and who is part of it. And the, that distinction of the friend and enemy, basically who is part of the nation who is not, is an a priori decision. For Schmidt, liberal could not be part of it, communists could not be part of it, anarchists could not be part of it, Jews could not be part of it, but most importantly, and is not sufficiently emphasized, Muslims could not be part of it. Muslims were completely against the very idea of of the political, not of politics, of the political. This is showing that how the political is indebted to Christianity. Uh, so this is this is a, a first form of naturalization. The second form is in the in question of citizenship, because Smith, in a long, very long chain, uh, 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 talks about the political friends or member of political community as the brother. So here we have patriarchy. 
fraternity runs through the canon, uh, 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 Western canon, Islam as well, Judaism as well, possibly others they haven't, uh, haven't explored enough. But, uh, uh, and so the idea is that the brother initially is one that has a genetic thigh, right? Uh, uh, so blood. Uh, eventually, this, this, this model of fraternity get transformed into con convention, basically nationality. But the idea is that who is the political member? Who is like me? And so sameness is the criteria of membership. And so this is a form of naturalizing, in fact, what, what, what are the criteria for counting as, as, as a member? So in a stroke, we have in, in Schmidt, uh, I think what gets exemplified is the connection between religion, race, and patriarchy all together. Now, another type of political thinking that is fundamentally liberal, but not only liberal, is, is this type of teleological thinking. The idea that you know, we have a, a, a view of where we are going into the future. The future might never realize itself, but it's a, it's a guidance for us or where we are going. And this is particularly evident in, those who are, in all those who think that the future of democracy, for being democracy, has to be liberal and secular. That is also what has happened in post-colonial time, right? Uh, uh, and so the problem with this, not simply with, with liberalism for me, that my interest is what type of understanding of reason is at work here? Is an understanding of reason that can that pretend to grasp in the present a finality of how, how uh, 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 what is the matter with human beings? What is to be human? What is the good? What is political community? And how we should apply it all over the world? And these are the processes of you know, defense of humanitarianism, uh, the intervention of democratic work, so on and, and so forth. Uh, so this is a type of reason that is calculative. It calculates from the present what can happen in the future. And this is fundamentally a capitulation to scientific rationality as calculation, as a form of instrumentality. Cannot reflect anymore on what are the goals or cannot reflect anymore of how do we, do we, do we negotiate different maxim of, of, of moral maxim, for instance. So there it mobilize an understanding of or a different understanding of time uh, uh, that has been uh, uh, also associated to quantum mechanics, but I can't enter there, uh, which he calls messianic. Now, the name seems very much connected to religion, but for him, it's connected to Marxism. And the idea here is this, that Marx promised an emancipation, right? The communist society, but also an injunction to act. And this is the idea of the 11 Theses of Power, but philosophers have interpreted the world, the point is to change it, right? So. Uh, there it is very much interesting. What, what is the structure of the promise? What, is, what does the structure of the promise tell us about how we understand the future now or time? And so the, the, the important point here is that there is not interest in telling us how the future will be. But the point is that the, for the future to be future, it has to be at least somehow undetermined. Otherwise, it's a replica of the present and of the past. Now, this is in the indeterminability, something we cannot control from the present. We cannot control for the present so that we establish from now, uh, uh, before social encounter with difference, how we go about uh, uh, living together. And so, uh, 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 and this, this, this possibility of breaking the present for Derrida is the non-contemporaneity. There are multiple history ongoing in the same present. And so when, uh, uh, you know, for those who have interacted with me in class or in comments, Whenever you invoke historicization, I come down and I say, okay, well, what do you mean by historicization? Which history are you talking about? Which notion of history are you using? Which history are you getting into when you go into history? Uh, 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 there is a possibility that there are multiple history and there are history that if, if people claim agency on the basis of, of, of God or ancestor, is that considered scientific? That is, can be, can be you know, considered seriously, that's what I mean. So, uh, the implication of this understanding of time is a form of openness uh, 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 for the understanding of reason and the political are twofold. At the level of reason, reason cannot uh, 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 establish from the present before encountering the other. So the idea here is you're not first normative and then you, you are in dialogue. The idea is to expose yourself to the encounter. And so there is the, being critical is the possibility of transforming your starting point, not simply holding on a stick point that uh, holds normative or moral truth to criticize a uh, 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 context around you. Um, second, uh, 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 because the encounter, because there is an awareness that at the foundation of any epistemic and political order, there is an original exclusion, as I was mentioning at the beginning with the white mythology, 
the, 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 the framework within which you are operating is not stable. It's based on, it's premised on exclusions, right? And, and, and therefore, you can't rely on the system in which you are operating. And so here it's an openness of reason, not simply to critique, but also to creativity. And so the idea is, 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 is to uh, 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 imagine maxim of, of dealing with difference somehow every time anew. And if it is any time anew, the very, if you think about it, the, what freedom might really mean is that there is no norm in itself. And the second point for, for political, for especially for the concept of the political, is that <laughs> if you cannot know who your enemy is up front, because the future, you cannot predict it in any way. How do you know who, who is your enemy or you, who is your friend or who is part of your national identity? now and, 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 and in the future, then uh, uh, the, you cannot close political community. Four minutes. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and so here the point is that what I'm trying to say that whatever we think that is associated with what is naturalized understanding of democracy today, which is liberal and secular, might not be necessarily the case. And so I pushed the issue, that is, I didn't go that far. I pushed the issue saying, that, does the democracy need to be secular in order to be democracy? Uh, and therefore, there is a possibility of thinking political community beyond secularism. Uh, and, and for me, once again, solving, the attempt to solve this distinction is to relapse into a racial thinking. And that's the connection between the theological, political, and racial thinking. Uh, 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 He has, a, he has uh, I, I elaborate his idea of democracy to come, but let's leave it maybe for, for, for the discussion. But the very idea that democracy for him is the only regime that gives the possibility of being so radical in questioning itself, that it opens up the possibility of suspending itself. And this possibility of suspension means that, as, as, as I was suggesting, that the future of democracy might not be secular. That doesn't, that doesn't mean, I, I want to clarify that uh, 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 it has to be religious. So let me let me get get to a conclusion so that uh, 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 we wrap up. So what I'm my arguing here is that the resources mobilized by the thought of Derrida, whom I think this I, I make a note about this. There, there were discussion about uh, uh, Africa as a unit of analysis. Thank you, uh, Dr. Katsatela. It's a lot of stuff. stuff. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much for the presentation of your thrust. We want to make sense, sense of it. it, and we would like to begin with uh, Yosef Sentayu, a Jamberi. Uh, Yosef is a, a PhD candidate. 
and uh, he has 15 minutes to ruminate over your work. And then we shall uh, proceed uh, with other discussions. Uh, Joseph, you're welcome. I think you're muted. Oh, that's a shame. Sorry. Can I start again? Yes, yes, we can, so hear, can you hear you now. So you can time me now. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you, the chair, uh, Dr. Kas uh, Dr. Kasule. And thank you, Dr. Casatera, for allowing me to discuss his book, which I think is very important and necessary on so many levels. So Dr. Casatera's book argues that the contemporary relationship between religion and politics is overdetermined by neither religion nor politics. This unique relationship- This is unique relationship is conceived as theological, political complex. I think there is an echo. Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. So the unique relationship between religion and politics uh, is conceived as the theological political complex. And it is defined as a problem of how the link, the dynamic link between religion and politics is involved in the constitution of power, society, and knowledge. A hyphen uh, in, instead of a space inserted between the terms theological and political indicates that what we are dealing with here is neither the logia of theos nor politicos, neither an account of the sacred nor the profane, neither an account of God nor an account of the political. The intellectual question at hand here is neither a domain of just religion nor a domain of politics per se. It is instead some kind of nexus or matrix, a complex, a dynamic, or a problem of their link that has a life of its own and that calls for an independent critical appraisal. The merit of such a critical appraisal lies in maintaining the problem rather than trying to solve it. This is precisely where the limitation of the dominant literature dealing with this topic can be found. Uh, namely, this literature tries to solve the problem, the problem of this nexus, rather than taking it as an analytical lens. Two types of discourse stand accused in this regard. The first is the discourse that collapses the political into the theological and vice versa. And this is found, for example, in Carl Schmitt's political theology or uh, Walter Benjamin's messianism uh, discussed in this book. Uh, maybe we can add here um, a 21st century example, uh, which is the discourse of the return of religion also known as neo-theo or neo-theocracy. 
The second type of discourse is what the book, the book identifies as neo-Kantian secularism, which separates political reason from religious faith. And this is especially found in the works of Jürgen Habermas and John Rawls. So the, the issue with both types of discourse is that they see the connection between religion and politics as something that needs to be done away with, either by collapsing the two into one another or by completely separating them. Because of this limitation, the book shows that there is a need for a different kind of thinking that employs the theological political complex as an analytical lens rather than a problem that has to be overcome. Casatella found this in Jacques Derrida's thought, especially in his later political writings, whose more abstract foundations, as the book shows, are already laid out in his earlier writings on language and time. Accordingly, the way I understand the book is that the first two chapters of the book provide a reading of Derrida's earlier works, and the last two chapters deal with his later works. And I think that the central argument of the book is found in chapter three. This chapter does two things. On the one hand, it provides a reading of Derrida's critique of secularism that exposes its Western Christian racialized and sexualized presuppositions and the, ro the role these presuppositions play in generating discriminatory hierarchies and practices. On the other hand, the chapter also presents a reading of Derrida's analysis of the complex interconnection between reason and faith and the pluralist, democratic, decolonizing, emancipatory potential of thinking about reason and faith as interrelated. So for the sake of time, uh, two remarks can be pointed out which the book, I think, could have reflected more cl closely. Um, so the first is simply the question of why Derrida's work? Why Derrida's works? Um, why is his analysis of the theological political complex chosen for this book project more broadly? Uh, um, there seems to be two reasons found in the book, um, or at least I found in the book. One is because, the, because of Derrida's biography or his lived experience. And the other reason is the intentions of his writings in themselves. However, I think that there may be an ambiguity here which, which requires clarification. Is it because Derrida was exposed but excluded from Berber, Arab Muslim, Arab Jewish, and French culture? Or because his writings in themselves were a rethinking of the theological political complex that his works are chosen to be a topic of this book? Uh, uh, to put it differently, uh, did Derrida write what he wrote because of he who he was, or did did he become who he was precisely because of what he wrote? And let me repeat this question. Um, uh, my apologies. Did Derrida write what he wrote because of who he was? Or did he become who he was precisely because of what he wrote? Is Dr. Casatella here interested in the political and intellectual context of Derrida the author, or the intellectual and political context of his works in themselves? 
I am asking this question because I believe uh, we can make, with all the problems, we can make a, a distinction between the author and the text. Thus, for example, we may ask, if Derrida's works were written by someone who, who is, let's say, a pure German like Heidegger, would, would Dr. Casatella write a similar book about Heidegger in spite of the latter's white German lived experience. The second remark uh, concerns the question, what does it mean to think with Derrida about the theological political complex that applies to all the new questions arising from it and to different contexts stretching across the globe? As we, as we can read from, from the book. Um, do we not here run the risk of universalizing his thought to an extent that reproduces the universalist mode of modern thought that Derrida was out to challenge in the first place? Um, maybe if I can add one more remark uh, about collapsing the theological and the, the political. Uh, although collapsing the theological into the political and vice versa has its limitations as rightly pointed out in the book, I think that reading the theological through the political and the political through the theological at times produce powerful interpretations with deep critical insights that can help us in the project of reimagining, re reconstituting, and transforming our modern condition. Um, in my own work, for example, I try to show that an endogenous allegorical reading of the Old Testament through the pre-modern history of state formation in, in Ethiopia affords us with uh, a critical resource to reimagine, reconstitute, and tra transform the contemporary question of national sovereignty in that country. So, yeah, so maybe um, we need to also acknowledge that there is a potential for um, powerful interpretations that may come from collapsing the two. Uh, with all the limitations involved in doing that. Um, I would like to conclude by recommending everyone to read this book. Um, it's well written and makes Derrida's difficult but necessary prose and vocabulary more accessible to an expert on Derrida. I believe that the book succeeded in going beyond Derrida through Derrida's thought. As such, it is not a commentary on Derrida's works. Dr. Casetella is not broadcasting Derrida in the book. Rather, he appropriately uses Derrida's voice to echo his own reflection and argument. Uh, I, I think I read somewhere, I think it is in points uh, in Derrida's published interview that uh, he admitted, Derrida admitted that deconstruction was not yet a political theory and that he did not know what deconstruction would be like in real politics. I think that this book is a contribution to the literature that tries to respond to, uh, to, respond to this limitation of de deconstruction. Uh, and uh, maybe on a different note, but above all, this book deserves an important place in the kind of critical scholarship advanced by the likes of Talal Assad and Sabah Mahmoud, uh, which now more than ever needs to be emphasized and more works like this are necessary. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joseph, for the wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to suggest that we hear from uh, Professor Silvana before uh, we come back to the audience.
Professor Silvana, if you're ready, please. Yes. Um... Um, I'm not sure. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, right. Uh, well, after such a wonderful introduction, and also the attempt at a strong critique by Joseph, uh, uh, I feel a bit kind of um, under the spotlight. Um, I'm very, very happy and honored to be here with you uh, at a deconstructive uh, distance, still as a member of the families, the expression would be the generative plurality to whom Andrea dedicates his book, this important book. So generative uh, plurality. In the short time I have, I will try to tell you of the intimate relationship, um, which is actually, you know, maybe a proof of how close we are, me and Andrea, because Andrea started with the question of relationality, the, 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 the relations that Derrida somehow deconstruction uh, implies and extends. But anyway, I will try to tell you of the intimate relation um, I believe are created, elaborated, and expanded by Andrea's book for the sake of the Deridian legacy in its focus on the question, the complex of the secular and its beyond, supported by its own ethical, political uh, engagement. So I'm referring to a relation of love with Derrida, a relation of friendship with me. And I mean, of course, Andrea has already mentioned the question of the politics of uh, brotherhood. Uh, I do believe me and Andrea have a relation which goes beyond this Western notion of friendship. Uh, um, the exposure is Andrea's own exposure to experiential dissemination. It is his cosmopolitan life, the singularity and the uniqueness of his own cosmopolitan experience. The question of sexual difference, the difference of his writing, for example, from my female inscription, the difference of l'écriture féminine, that at the same time has never affected the unconditionality of our common belief in deconstruction. And finally, the political meaning they address, the Andrea's contribution addresses to us, the important address to the community of his uh, readers, the ones who choose rightly to follow him along his critical path. I will go through all this very quickly, as quickly as I can, hopefully trying to make some sense of it. So the love between Andrea and Derrida, I don't know if this will respond somehow to what Joseph was questioning, but I do believe that for both of them, Derrida and Andrea, it is the love they feel for the theory and practice of deconstruction, or in another way, their common passion that exposes reason. Andrea was asking what is reason. I will only say reason with a capital letter to its other, itself, to reason to itself, the relation to itself as other. This double bind on the realm, realm of the psychic uh, will always and already return in Andrea's intellectual and practical interest. So I would say that the question is, if reason wants to save itself from itself, it must be critical to its autoimmune autonomy, to its principle of uh, universality and sovereignty, disentangling itself from the theology, from the telos of progress, with dialectics and metaphysics, as he very well explained before, being its lethal tools, so as to be able to stay open to difference, to the encounter with the other, to the dis 
this junction and the postponement of difference, its openness to the undecidable, to the question of suspension, to the critique of the racist colonial logics carried out by the secular. This is, in my view, the scope of Andrea's book, to awaken Derrida's legacy as a political thinker, to focus on the trial of the secular, to profess uh, faith in the utopian future, a figure of a future of justice. What Derrida quoted by Andrea calls messianism without messiah. So I would uh, ever imagine to be able to hint, at least to hint at the immensity of the theoretical and practical task that Beyond the Secular assumes in its project. I know that Andrea is a friend, a dear friend, who has always come to help me in instances of danger, doubt, and confusion. It has been a friend also in the his presentation in this occasion too. I believe Andrea will allow me to share here very shortly, but publicly, the dedication he has written to me on the gift of his book, which is also a gift of synthesis that I always associate to Andrea. The dedication runs, Silvana, the Mediterranean and the vertiginous fate animate these pages and my reading of the anti-racist strength of Derrida, Andrea. So the Mediterranean faith, the anti-racist reading. Andrea is writing to me, but he's also offering the framing of his own experience as an engaged thinker, the animation of his belief, his life of a responsible reader, the exposure, the commitment, his profession of faith, his intervention in a disciplinary debate, the political apport of his writing. So the Mediterranean, let me say precisely Northern Africa, Palestine. I will always remember Andrea's enthusiasm when he was working with his beloved students in Ramallah, his persistent and unconditional engagement with the Palestinian question with the question of Africa. Long ago, we met in Dakar, then he went to Palestine, is now in Uganda. Andrea exposes his, himself to a cosmopolitanism. Not long ago, before COVID, he came to Naples, another location of the Global South, to give a wonderful lecture on the cosmopolitan in Derrida. Anyway, he exposes himself to a cosmopolitanism that keeps a vertiginous face in the strength, the creativity, the cultural life of Africa, the continent where Andreas appeal to an anti-racist and anti-colonial reading of the construction finds his raison d'etre, expanding and mobilizing more intellectual and political forces, possibly meaning the move from the privileged location of Europe and America, where Derrida activated his deconstructive operations, to the urgency of a more personal and active exposure to the destinies of the rich of the earth. I'm referring to what I know is occupying Andrea's interest today, very consistently in the activism and psychoanalytic thinking, a practice of Franz Fanon, but also referring to Andrea's own practice of care for the psychic suffering of Ugandan women and children. It is a deep and profound commitment to Africa and its people. It is also a strong commitment to the discipline political theory, the theology, but mainly, as he already uh, made very, very clear, translation studies. I cannot enter into the disciplinary commitment of beyond the secular in terms of its critique, radical critique, of the assimilation, appropriation, destruction, annihilation of difference operated by the Western logic of translation. 
in the colonial and post-colonial interventions of the neoliberal capital in Africa on the entire globe yesterday as much as today. Andrea reads this politics of property and appropriation claiming is absolute and radical difference from it. I know that I'm here also because I share a critical vicinity to some women scholars in the area of post-colonial studies inscribed along the, this deconstructive legacy, in particular Gayatri Chagabrati Spivak, especially in her theories on the culture and politics of translation. Spivak thinks that the post-colonial translator needs to adopt an intimate reading of the text she translates, expressing political and cultural accountability in the face of her readership, while working for the empowerment of the voice of the so-called other. Well, I invite you all to follow Andrea's intimate politics of reading as translation in the face of Derrida's voice and writing. The only example I can provide here is his use of magnificent quotations. Some quotations where Derrida is lucid and precise to state in a magnificently limpid rhetoric the political scope of his deconstructive enterprise. Exposed to the language of deconstruction, Following the traces of his political engagement, so well called upon by Andrea's intimate reading as translation, one comes to wonder why Derrida has ever been framed as aloof, detached, unpolitical. A French philosopher, never or very rarely the Algerian partisan, the Mediterranean thinker, the African revolutionary. Let me finish with the difference between Andrea's style and my own engagement with the poetry of deconstruction. Andrea operates a style of writing which Derrida would associate to Nietzsche, Le Perron, Stiletto, the spur or spurring effect. Andrea hammers the Derridian text with precision, a total passion, his inscription insisting and persisting in reading, quoting, elaborating, opening up what is already there and at the same time allowing for the otherwise to happen. It is the philosophy of the hammer. Personally, my reading of the Rida is more poetic, less political perhaps. Perhaps the counter signature of an animal the animal that really illuminates this wonderful text, which is called in Italian, Che cos'è la poesia? What is poetry? Um, the animal is the um, hedgehog, l'istrice, le risson, um, that rolls herself up to escape the accident, only to face even more help helplessly her own exposure to death. Indeed, I can say that both my poetic writing and Andrea's political reading, both of them are blessed by the laughter of a woman, another woman, the magnificent Molly Bloom in Ulysses by Joyce, the woman who says yes to life, professing her conditional affirmation of life. So yes, Beyond the Secular affirms, yes, the Derrida is a political and radical thinker. Yes, it shows and claims with success that it exists what opposes all logics of assimilation, appropriation, and annihilation represented by the secular. Yes, Beyond the Secular, there is the future to come, and the book, Andrea's book, is adamant in affirming that this future to come belongs to the language of the promise, to the promise of another language and another future. Derrida would say, il faut l'avenir, the future must be. I will conclude celebrating Andrea's future commitments 
is further imaginations. And I know the culture and art are really deeply in his art. So his further imaginations of another world and another future to come. Thank you. We thank you, Professor Karo Tenuto, for the wonderful uh, discussion of the book. We want to come back in the room. We want to come back to Dr. Jacob Katumusime. Uh, you have 15 minutes to tell us your reading of Casatella's interpretation of Derrida. Wow. Thank you so very much, Maiza, for these opportunities always. Uh, I wish that after listening into um, uh, Professor Silvana, that was, I wasn't going to be the one to come in because uh, that was powerful, powerful uh, reading and uh, of, 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 of Andrea, the scholar and the person. And uh, congratulations, Prof. Congratulations, Andrea, uh, upon this publication. Uh, I think it's a very important, if not novel, contribution of the critique of the secular. No doubt, no doubt. Um, so how do I read uh, Beyond the Secular? Uh, so the critique of the secular um, has often been a secular critique. In, in this book, Beyond the Secular, um, Andrea attempts to move, to, uh, attempts a move beyond a secular critique of the secular. So we may ask how secular has been the secular critique of the secular. Um, so the secular critique of the secular has continually imagined the banishment um, of and you know, disappearance of religion from public life. Um, and, and why is religion wished out of public life? So there's a modernist and rather secularist assumption that religion is without reason. Um, that to involve religion in politics is to bring about chaos. Yet as Andrea contends in this book, religion is continually calibrated in the different spheres of, of public life. It in fact has never disappeared. In any case, Andrea observes the term religion has a Christian origin and thus its history a Christian history. Um, how then can we think with the term when talking about non-Christian religious traditions such as Islam, Buddhism, and you can even add our own other forms of, you know, what we want to call traditional worship. So regardless of this conceptual dilemma in using the term religion, Andrea observes the persistence of religion in contemporary politics. So. Andrea interrogates the nexus between the theological and the political. And so where is this interrogation necessary? He argues that because when we look at political authority today, when we look at um, the way of life in communities today, and even knowledge today, they are founded around this connection between religion and politics. Uh, what Andrea prefers to call the theological political complex as imagined by Spinoza and then explored by Derrida. So in fact, Andrea's own exploration of the theological political emerges from his reflection as he has shown here on the Derrida's rendition of the theological political reality. This is done through traversing Derrida's writings over the ages. Andrea contends that Derrida's thought offers powerful resources, here I'm quoting, 
the reader thought offers powerful resources to critically rethink the theological political nexus beyond the secular paradigm. So why the reader yourself asked this question? Andrea reads the reader as one who not only joins that the critique of the who not only joins the critique of the binaries of modernity, such as is seen in the separation of religion and politics, but also as one who on, enables us to see that religion operates on reason. In fact, Andrea presents the reader as a source of a decolonial potential. To think decolonization, Andrea calls us to think through Derrida. So in thinking through Derrida, so he thinks with about around, so this is why I'm saying he thinks through Derrida because he moves beyond him in many ways. Andrea thus intends to offer, so in thinking through Derrida, Andrea intends to offer us a decolonial ap approach to the theological political. He, he didn't give it, you know, attention while here. I think, I hope he can be able to explore this more. So what makes the reader a prophet of decolonization? What decolonial resources does the reader offer us? So in the reader's autobiography or biography, Andrea sees an individual who is not bound by the philosophical confines of Western colonial modernity. How? Andrea calls us to look at Derrida, who as a Franco Maghrebian Jew from Algeria manages to transcend French philosophy, even while he is raised in French cultural traditions. So he knows French, he speaks only French. He, he says this is the language, you know, but he manages to, to move beyond its, you know, um, uh, uh, cultural um, 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 uh, um, items in thinking about the world around him. So um, 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 Derrida is at once African, Algerian, Black, Jewish, Arab, Arab Jew. And while he's raised as a French linguist in a French linguistic environment, he's denied French citizenship as a Jew. So uh, I think this relates to the question Yosef was asking, what, what um, about Derrida's thinking? Is, is it made by his environment or is the writing that makes him what he is? So Derrida above all offers a critique, and this is important in Cassetel's book. Derrida offers a critique of race, which as Andrea defines it, is a structure of power used ordering public life through epistemic and political exclusionary hierarchies. So Derrida critiques uh, racialized discourses and, 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 and the racism in his work. So this is one of the things that you see Andrea try to grapple with in the book. So how does the reader achieve this? So the reader does so through especially the critique of language, which he views as always founded on given geopolitics that define the meanings of that particular language. So, and thus to impose it on other contexts is to build a linguistic hegemony. So this is what he was trying to explain here. When you pick the concept religion and impose it on other faith traditions, you, 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 you are imposing a hegemony because the, 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 there's a politics of translation there that um, you, you, have, you are not considering. The reader Derafa, as Andrea observes, lends us a critique of the universalist tendency of language. And how is this very important to our present, knowing this dynamic? So it forces us to think about the language of the secular order that we deploy on a daily, you know, every, so, so, and in this book, you, you, you see that Andrea is saying the concepts we, we use around all the time are secular concepts, you know? And so from where does it emerge, this language that we use on a daily, yeah? So the paradox is that while translation of language is necessary, 
it is impossible to attain its totality. So we have to communicate. <laughs> but how do we communicate? Yeah. Through Derrida, we, we see that we cannot have a transparent translation. So the, the reader's rendition of this paradox is that nothing is translatable, yet at the same time, everything is translatable. Yeah. So um, uh, the, uh, this untranslatability of language challenges the universalist concepts that we have come to often embrace. Um, and, and this is what you are saying here, that there's no meta language, you know. So it challenges the language of the secular that we import into our lived experiences, you know. So secularism's claim of a meta language is only a facade. Um, and, and so that being the case, um, how then do we undertake translation of, of uh, things, ideals, concepts like the religious? Um, with which language can we speak of things like the sacred? Yeah, you no. Know, often translation obscures histories of words. This is what you see in reading Andre and, and his, his reading of Derrida. And also, uh, it, translation universalizes the culture within which words emerge. Um, so, for example, he's convinced that even the very concept of secularization emerges from a Christian tradition. And so the, the Christian tradition is the particular from within which this concept secularization emerges. And, and, and this is even to further be complicated more with the knowledge that the language of Christianity is Latin. So this is another particular, you know? So indeed, how then do we universalize it over customs like Islam? traditions. So translation then becomes entangled in an imperial and racializing project. Uh, this is what you see reading the, the, the book. So the secularization that invades sacred language becomes more than linguistic. It becomes political. Um, um, in fact, the more complex part is here in that when we imagine the political as secular, we are actually also acknowledging the political as Christian because <laughs> the political has, a, the secular has Christian roots. So when we imagine the political as secular, we are also imagining it at the same time as Christian, you know? Why? Because secularization is a Christian category. So why do we find us, where, where, where do we find ourselves then? We find ourselves in a place at a place where Christianity, whether explicitly or implicitly, is ordering human life. It's what guides our human daily life. The, the acts we perform in the private or in the public, knowingly and unknowingly, are Christian acts. Uh, when, for example, a traditionalist claims that his faith practice is a religion, he or she is rendering his sacred act in Christian terms. This is now me reading. <laughs> the same goes for the Muslim who calls Islam a religion, a Buddhist who calls Buddhism a religion. They are subjecting self under a Christian hegemony, which is both theological and political. This therefore is the politics of translation. To the extent that even the most endearing ideals of our present era, citizenship, democracy, they are entangled in this form of hegemonic conscription. So what is to be done? Do we find ourselves in, in a place of languagelessness? You know, in a place where we do not name namelessness? So in Derrida's way of deconstruction, Andrea establishes a breakthrough. And what is this breakthrough? So in Derrida, Andrea also finds the solution in what Derrida calls a language of promise. So this language of promise is a form of translation that is not a translation in the secular sense of the word. It's a translation, but not a translation in the secular sense of the word. So the language of promise goes universal without instituting a hegemony, yeah? So in this language of promise, the reader finds a universal value. 
what, uh, uh, that does not carry out the universalizing translation characteristic of secular language. So which, as we have seen in, is particular to a Christian tradition, this, the secular language. So Andrea calls it vigilant universalism. You can call it critical universalism. I thought that was powerful, vigilant universalism, powerful. So Andrea is fascinated with the reader's conception that we can actually have universal reason without it being subject to a given particular, to a particular nation. So I, I really, Prof, I want to congratulate you, powerful book. I, I, for the sake of time, I want to just ask a few questions. Um, we can explore more. So given that the book is more interpretive, my questions really seek more clarification than they are pushbacks or what. And can, they can hopefully enable us to understand what Andrea is saying of or about Derrida. So the first question is uh, a Nazareth school question of yes and or no answer, you know? So would it be true for someone to argue that when Andrea talks about the political today, he is without even mentioning it, talking about the religious? Because the, 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 the political as is today is secular and as is the secular is Christian. And, and so for someone to talk about the political, they're talking about the religious. And two, is the secular homogenous? Um, I'm asking this question um, in view of, you know, of, of the secular's Christian history. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to ask, couldn't uh, other secularisms have arisen outside of the Christian tradition? Couldn't we have found, uh, couldn't we have, uh, couldn't there have emerged secularisms elsewhere? So three, can we think of the secular as inherently racist or a racist sphere that to think with it is we are thinking with, he with hegemonies, yeah, yeah? So, and, and then there has been a whole tradition of a secular critique. But like I've, I started saying, it, it, the secular critique has always been a secular critique of this. The, the critique of the secular has always been a secular critique. And this book be, moves beyond a secular critique of the secular. So the question I am asking is from all this literature on the secular uh, that has been a special secular critique of the secular, is there any sensible thing we can move with forward? Is there something we can derive from the secular critique, uh, existent secular critique of the secular or even of religion? So then, uh, this is a question Yosef also was asking. Could you speak more to the place of autobiography in imagining the colonial knowledge? Um, I'm asking now in relation to the reader's own lived experience as also subject of colonialism as highlighted in the book and how this lived experience is able to resist power without reproducing that power. Because one of the things we have seen in contemporary agency is, um, 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 uh, is agents that reproduces the logic of power that is derivative always again and again. How does Derrida overcome this? So you also seem to agree with Dussel and Derrida that some customs in the colonized world remained outside European modernity. In simple terms, outside the colonial structure and where that's not a factor by Western colonialism. So would you speak more to this? You, for example, mention Islam. There are others. Uh, we have talked on the sidelines of you know, the corridors, and I know there are others you believe have not. So do you believe there are customs that remained alien to European modernity? And, and, and could you expand more on this? What does that mean? Then, whereas you present Derrida as attentive to the particular, uh, isn't Derrida re Der Derrida's rendering of the particular, and in this case, nationalism, as always 
tending towards a universality, a contradiction, because we saw that we can think from the particular, move, move towards the universal without creating a hegemony. So isn't this a contradiction in a way? Um, um, so we are led to think of a, of a universal reason, for example, we continue to imagine universal reason. Um, that, that is not bound by a particular nation, but a, part, part, a certain particular. But what if we've thought of different universalisms, the universals instead, instead of this one universal? What if we thought of different universals? Why do we want to form, in the end, from whatever particular we come from, why do we want to create one universal? Why can't we have different universes? What is impossible about creating different universes? So isn't the search for one universal, despite its non-universality, still founded on the Western episteme? Uh, why can't we think, like I'm emphasizing, of several universes? So a few last questions so <laughs> so while remaining christian can the category religion have emerged outside an imperial uh, um, um, uh, an, an imperial flavor this category religion could it have emerged elsewhere without this imperial flavor that the christian world of, of, uh, puts upon it and is the christian tradition inherently political and also colonial, to the extent that we cannot salvage it, that to deal with the tradition is to deal with the hegemony, yeah? Um, so let's talk about the language of promise that is so, you know, clear in, in your reading of Derrida. Two minutes, yes, I'll, I'll be done. So if the solution is in the language of promise, which is, as I read, is subversive, yet not revolutionary. Um, isn't there a risk of sustaining the structures on which secular hegemonies thrive? And therefore you find that whereas the language of promise thrives, it thrives along the language of the master. That we it does not dispose the language of the master. The language of the master remains and it, it, it too continues to thrive. And so if the language of promise bears a decolonial potential, um, uh, isn't there a danger of a decolonization that fails to reform the structures of hegemony? Isn't this decolonization remaining a performative one? And so how also do you contend with the fact that while the universalizing language of secularism has majorly defined public life today, from the inception of the modern project, the traditions that have been continually denied entry into this modern secular you know, world. They are thought of as counter-modern, counter-secular. So I, I'm asking this question in a big way, but let me make it a little clear. What would the language of promise look like be for the customary? Because the, 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 the reader's deconstruction does not destroy the customary, yeah? So the last question. So considering the reader's critique of teleology, what is the relevance? What is the importance of these discourses we are having here of decolonization as a future, to, you know? Because we are saying, let's not think about the future as this. So, but decolonization is a particular future, really. So it's a political moment for many of us. And, and, and so uh, how can we achieve, uh, uh, isn't this a, an, an ideological contradiction, especially because the book of, seeks to tell us that in reading the reader, there's a decolonial potential. Yet the reader is telling us, stop this uh, uh, fascination with the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katumusime. We have two more discussions. Um, we shall have another discussion from uh, Dr. Yahya Seremba. Yahya Seremba is uh, 
a research fellow at MISA. He convenes courses that are interdisciplinary, um, interested in identity, political violence, political thought, post-colonial thought, etc. His latest book is Islam and the production, sorry, America and the production of Islamic truth in Uganda. And he launched that last year. Uh, we are happy to have him on the other side of the podium. Dr. Seremba, you are welcome to give uh, your understanding of Kasatela's understanding of Derrida. Um, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kasule, uh, the chair. I thought Dr. Kasule would have allowed the philosophers to speak first uh, before the rest of us come to dilute the, uh, the source with our uh, non-philosophical uh, readings. I join those who have uh, congratulated Andrea, shall we wait for the other one? So I was saying that uh, the chair should have allowed Dr. Spire to come first because he, like Andrea, Josef, um, uh, the professor online, and uh, uh, Jacob are philosophers. <laughs> or they have a background in philosophy before uh, the rest of us can uh, bring our, our other thoughts. And I'm still wondering why Andrea found it important to, to have me on the list of discussants when he's fully aware that uh, I'm, I'm alien to, 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 to philosophy. So I join those who have congratulated Andrea on the, on the publication of this uh, very important, uh, 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 very insightful book. I think this book, Andrea, establishes you as a philosopher and as a political theorist who must be taken seriously. And I also join those who have called upon um, all of us to, to read uh, this book, which is written, notwithstanding its engagement of very complex issues, written in a language that is accessible by, uh, by many of us. Um, so uh, there is a striking similarity between the Andrea who writes the book and the Andrea that I have observed over the past two years. I cannot claim to know Andrea very well. Uh, I have only seen him for two years. Before that, I had seen him once in Mali for, for some few days. 
But for the past two years, Andrea has been consistent in his critique of this PhD program at MISA. Not in bad faith, a critique, not in bad faith, of course, a critique that seeks to improve, uh, to reform the pro program for the better. Which critique he has also extended to the founder of this program, none other than Mahmoud Mamdani. So Andrea's critique has always been, the, been that uh, the interdisciplinary PhD program does not pay uh, deserving attention to the question of culture. Culture as broadly understood also to include religion, to the, to the question of culture, and especially to the, to the question of, of, of religion. And uh, he has proposed a course which he will teach with me on, on religion, on, on, on non-Western religious thought. He's also le leading a group of which I'm a member that seeks to, to incorporate religion in, in, in our understanding of, of the political. So this, this, this comes out very clearly in, in the book, in his critique of secularism, his critique of, of secularism, but also his critique of the derivative responses to secularism. So for instance, he has a critique of the secular state, but he also has a critique, even if he doesn't explore it in detail, a critique of the religious state. For instance, the Islamic state. <laughs> So, uh, I find this critique extremely uh, eliminate, eliminating. So, for a long time, we were told that the modern secular nation state has saved humanity, at least civilized sections of humanity, from religion. Uh, this we are told was achieved through the privatization of religion so that reason reigns as the foundation of public principle, as the foundation of the law. Even the critics of the modern liberal nation state saw no place for religion in public life, including those interested in the colonial thought, as Andrea has, has often told us. Many of them celebrated what they considered as the death of religion, Religion was seen as the best example of the hate of irrationality and the main manifestation of the primordial traditionalism that must give way to reason, science, liberalism, capitalism, and so on. Dominant forms of Western thought, whether liberal and liberal or anti liberal, have been united in their radical distinction between reason and religion, science and faith, progress and stagnation and so on. Such dominant forms of Western thought uh, of different persuasions of Fadino critique of secularism, apart from merely seeking to improve it and perfect it. Andrea goes outside of the dominant forms of Western thought and identifies a French thinker who lived in Algeria for considerable time known as Derrida. Andrea examines Derrida's ideas and mounts a critique of Western philosophy, of Western political theory, and of the modern secular nation state. Not only does he offer a critique, but he also explores ways of going beyond the narrowness of Western authored political modernity. Andre begins his critique of political modernity with a critique of philosophy. Philosophy, he tells us, as pre previous discussions have pointed out, is contextual even if it may not be reduced to context. If Western philosophy has assumed universality as embodied in such phenomena as the modern nation state, it has done so through violence and colonialism. And I quote, according to this schema, ideas presented as universal remain irreducibly linked to the context of their origins. And thus, they can only be made universally valid through forced impositions and translations 
that hide the conditions affecting their formation while excluding other alternatives. Philosophy is culture specific. This is something that he points out repeatedly in the book tied to historical, linguistic, political circumstances in which it is produced. If philosophy is culture specific, Christianity is the culture or the key component of this culture that has shaped Western philosophy. We cannot understand political modernity and Western colonialism without the ways in which these phenomena relate with relate to Europe's Christian heritage. He acknowledges that reason and philosophy are not mere instruments of domination, but neither are they detached from politics. A philosophical language, he tells us, or the categories of philosophical reflection is not different from language generally, which is not free from political determinations. Uh, he says that this culture-specific limitation of philosophy cannot be resolved through translation. Whereas thinkers like Schmidt, Habermas, and others that he critiques think that the Christian theological heritage can be translated and secularized into neutral concepts of the secular state and secular law. Andrea's reading of the reader indicates that the secular actually remains Christian. Translation, whether it takes the form of secularization, cannot resolve the culture-specific limitation of philosophy. Attempts at translation have only driven Western domination in col and colonialism. And I quote again, he says, translation is the operation through which culture-specific understandings and institutions have been exported worldwide. There cannot be a neutral language to constitute the basis of public reason, the basis of public law, um, the basis um, of, of, of the state. So if, if translation is a, is a vehicle that delivers Western epistemic and political domination, it follows that Andrea understands colonialism as assimilation. Derrida allows Andrea to see how the West has conscripted the rest of the world into the Western culture and political self. We are familiar with this conceptualization of colonialism as assimilation, which is best identified with the decoloniality school that originates in Latin America. The critique of the conceptualization of colonialism as assimilation as assimilation of the native into Western culture, Western epistemology, Western political logic, and so on, is that this understanding of colonialism as, as assimilation is blind to colonialism as preservation of the native and the cultural logic of, of the native. This is what indirect rule sought to accomplish in much of the colonized world to preserve the culture and the religion of the native. And uh, I would have loved to see how Derrida allows Andrea to examine this specific form of colonialism, which does not seek to assimilate, to secularize, to civilize, but one that seeks to preserve the native and his culture, his religion, his custom, and so on. Only then, I think, can we formulate a critique of not only the Western model of modern state, critique of the African model of the modern state, of the Indian model, state, and so on. Point out is that uh, this is one of the areas in which Mahmoud Mamdani has done a great job, as we all know. Uh, Mamdani explores the intersection between history and culture region to shed light on the specific manifestation of colonialism in the non-Western world. So Mamdani takes us beyond the preoccupation with race and the racism, which is what the reader focuses on, and centers tribe in uh, uh, the development of colonialism, specifically in Africa and elsewhere 
uh, in, in, in the non-Western world. So the category race and racism, which uh, the Ridafa focuses on and which uh, Andrea builds on becomes insufficient race. So, um, so I, 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 I think that uh, Andrea can do well by, by incorporating uh, Mamdani in his critique of uh, of of of, uh, of Western uh, colonialism. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Andrea has always claimed that Mamdani is not interested in culture and religion. I sometimes wonder whether the Mamdani that Andrea refers to is the same Mamdani that I have read and interacted with for seven years, seven full years, five as his student and two as his mentee, as a postdoc. I think one day, Andrea and I should have a showdown on how to read Mamdani. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know whether the showdown will be public or closed to the public. But we should definitely be one. I wonder how can a professor of anthropology, which is what Mamdani is, not be interested in culture? As, as we all know, Mamdani, among his different professorships at Columbia University, he is professor of anthropology. How can such a professor be not be interested in culture and, and, and religion? Uh, so I, I suppose that Andrea's source of confusion with regard to reading Mamdani is that he thinks that Mamdani focuses on how politics shapes culture and ignores the other side of what would be a dialectic relationship. So that is something that we shall need to debate Andrea when the time of the showdown comes. Uh, 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 so for now, I should point out quickly that Mamdani of course has two notions of custom the custom that is captured by the colonial state, but also he has a notion of custom that uh, survives capture, that is constantly critiquing this custom that is captured by, by the state. And it is in this other custom that he explores possibilities for decolonization. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so let me let me also uh, expound a, a little further the question of decolonization, which uh, which Andrea pursues more extensively uh, in the in the last chapter, even if he does not repeatedly use the word decolonization. So, if colonialism, as manifested in the dominance of Western philosophy, epistemology, political institutions, is rooted in Western culture. It follows that decolonization must be rooted in the cultures of non-Western societies without, without necessarily seeking to invert the relationship between the religious and secular. And Andre is very clear on that. He's not, he's not advocating for the creation of a, a religious state, a theocratic state, but he's saying nevertheless that the culture of the colonized, and this is also reflected in his attempt to reform this PhD program, the, the culture of the colonized must be taken seriously into consideration when we think about uh, uh, decolonization. So he specifically focuses on Islam in the last chapter. Unfortunately, I wasn't here, Andrea, when you presented this chapter on Islam. So I don't know whether you addressed some of the questions that I want to raise. <laughs> so according to Andrea, Derrida provides insights to the decolonization of the relationship between the religion between religion and politics by pointing to ways in which this relationship can be reconstructed uh, from an Islamic uh, perspective without creating an Islamic uh, theocratic state. Uh, so my first question here, um, Andrea, you seem to distinguish between Islamic and Islamicate. You use two concepts, Islamic and Islamicate. And I suppose that you borrow this distinction between Islamic and Islamicate from Marshall, I don't know how to read this name, Hudson? Hudson. Hudson, thank you. 
from Marshall Hudson's The Venture of Islam. He uses the terms Islamic to mean Islam as religion, Islam as faith, Islam as the core of, of uh, the Islamic religion, and Islamicate to mean the wider culture and social life inspired by Islam and religion, which may also include non-Muslims. Hodgson identifies something core at the heart of Islam around which he formulates the concept of Islamicate. The rest, which includes the broader, cultures, the broader culture and broader society that has been shaped by Islam, the core he calls Islamicate. If that is the distinction that you have in mind, Professor Andrea, I'm afraid that it reproduces the assumptions of those whom you critique, those who draw a radical distinction between the religious and the secular. For how are you going to establish analytically the difference between Islam as core religion, as core religious phenomena, and Islam as mere culture or social influence? Analytically, how are you going to to, to, to see the difference between these two categories. Are you going to use the text as the yardstick of this distinction, such that what is inscribed in the text is core Islamic religion, and what is not is merely Islamic culture? Are you going to use the text, the Hadith, the Sunnah, the Quran, as the basis of this uh, distinction? I think I think that would drive you only into some sort of essentializing Islam. To avoid this kind of essentialism, I suggest that you simply use the concept of Islamic to mean everything that you associate with Islam, instead of erecting a binary between faith and culture, between religion, the core of Islam, and religion, the other subsidiary, secondary uh, aspects, because uh, such a distinction has been has been contested uh, uh, strongly um, uh, uh, by by many scholars recently. Um, so one of them, of course, is Shahab Ahmed, especially his critique of Talal Asadi's notion of Islam as as orthodox centered. Uh, um, so let me also revisit this question, which previous discussants have asked of why Derrida is important in rethinking the relationship between religion and politics. And I would like to add rethinking this re relationship from an Islamic perspective. Andrea says that Derrida draws from his Algerian culture influence, which is considerably uh, Islamic. Uh, so interestingly, Andrea, himself acknowledges that Derrida has no engagement with Islamic texts, and neither did he speak Arabic or Baba. This means that Andrea, when he talks about Islam, he's relying on secondary sources and he has, he has no contact with Islamic texts, with Islamic sources whatsoever. He doesn't speak the language, of the people in which he lives in Algeria. So what is the basis on which we should take him seriously when he talks about Islam? So all the thinkers he's engaging with are Western thinkers, the overwhelming majority of them, Schmidt, Habermas. He's engaging with Western thinkers. He's not engaging with a single Islamic thinker a single African thinker. Yet here you are presenting him as an African thinker. So what is African in his thought or Islamic? What makes him an African thinker? If he, 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 he doesn't draw even remotely from, um, he doesn't, he has, he has no engagement or with, with African with African thinkers. African um, uh, 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 African sources. Uh, beyond citing passages in which Derrida questions the common European stereotypes of Islam, which stereotypes he himself 
himself sometimes reproduces. And beyond offering a critique of secular discourses that put religion in opposition to reason, it is see what philosophy does the reader produce that uh, those interested in decolonization from an Islamic perspective should take uh, into consideration. So I thought that you were a little bit overstretching the reader to introduce him in conversations on Islam and decolonization. It's a, it's a little bit of an overstretching. Having said that, uh, um, I really congratulate you and whatever I've said ha sh should have nothing to do or little to do with the, uh, uh, the insightfulness and the originality of the work that you have produced, which all of us, I emphasize, must read. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Serimba. I would like to invite uh, Professor Spire Sentongo to give um, the last discussion, and then we can open to the floor with some questions. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, um, the beauty with coming last or the advantage is that quite often you don't have much to add. <laughs> so I don't know whether Dr. Kasule did it deliberately. Uh, this time, let me effectively preempt Spy and I see what, whether he will remain with anything to say. But the advantage of it is that even if you had nothing to say, you can easily say that it has all been said. Yeah, but I thank those who have spoken before me. Much of what I wanted to speak as they spoke, I was counseling, uh, which means that we'll have more time given that it's already a half past. So I had a lot of flowers for Casatella. I crossed out the flowers. I had some poetry. I canceled that because it was effectively done. I had some libation to do for Mamdani. Dr. Serenda did it effectively. So I think the spirits of Mais are happy now. In good faith. <laughs> Yes, nevertheless, I'm really happy. Thanks, uh, Dr. Casatera, for inviting me to speak, uh, to discuss your book. And I hope this will console Seremba. Although I have a background in phil uh, philosophy, specifically ethics, when Dr. Casera, Casatera invited me, at first I was hesitant, and I tried to dodge him, I have to confess, because I had heard that the book is difficult. <laughs> And I have a particular bias against books that are difficult. Although someone said that uh, if you read a book and find it difficult, it means it was not written for you. But I still want to believe that for many of the books or anything that we write, if the intent is to communicate, the scope should be as wide as possible. So I should aim at including as many people as possible. Well, that's part of my academic conviction, even in writing that I try to write specifically to expand the scope as much as I can. But that was a bias based on a rumor. I had not read the book, although Dr. Casatella had already presented it uh, in the department. But by then, we did not have the benefit of the book itself. Yeah, having read it, yes, I still partly feel that it is a difficult book. But I don't put it on Dr. Casatella because I don't. it might not be easy speaking about Derrida in a very simple language. How do you explain what is complex in simple terms? Mm -hmm. Some people read Derrida and say that he's very easy. I think maybe the problem is with me and my biases. The many times I've tried to go back to Derrida on grammatology and whatever, I don't find the work particularly receptive. 
I find him to be intent at communicating to a particular category, which is not often something that we do with awareness as authors. At times you think you're writing as simply as you can, only to get someone coming back to say that this is too complicated. I might as well be here speaking about those that are complicated. Here there are people complaining about my own work. Yeah, but I think that it always has to be that a deliberate effort at simplifying scholarly work because we already have, we have uh, excluded so many people, especially speaking from the South. I feel that it is unfair for us to, especially if you're doing field research, you collect much of this information from people and when it comes to talking about it, you exclude it by using a language that they cannot access. Not just in terms of it being English, but even the kind of English that is used. So I was keen on that even as I was reading this uh, text. Nevertheless, I commend Dr. Casatera for the courage, first of all, of selecting Derrida. You say that you did it uh, accidentally. It wasn't really deliberate. But I think even if I accidentally landed on Derrida, I would uh, go <laughs> around him. So I commend your efforts at uh, landing on him accidentally and remaining with that conviction that you should use his work to understand or to make sense of uh, secularism. You mentioned uh, somewhere in the book that one of the limits of your reading and deployment of Derrida or trying to methodically use his work is that you are relying on translations. I wanted to ask at the beginning if you speak French. If you do, maybe that makes it better for you because somewhere you invite us saying that maybe the readers will be the ones to judge if you have succeeded in representing Derrida effectively. I'm not one of those that will judge effectively. My French is not beyond what I picked from Congolese songs. <laughs> Yeah, so I was mostly at the mercy of your translations and the translations in his text. But I, I, I don't know what Derrida himself felt around. Yes, and I'm not talking about David. The <laughs> I don't know what Derrida himself felt about translations of his books, given his views about uh, the limitations of translation, the translatability of certain things. And I've not read anywhere if he has particularly commented on that, whether he was unhappy with particular translations. I know that in some cases he has expressed discomfort with how uh, deconstruction has been understood and presented. But the beauty of work that is a bit abstract and not easy to penetrate is that anyone can always appropriate it and give it its own their own meanings, which I've seen so many people do with Derrida's work just use it to speak to what we want it to speak to. So it's both a problem, but also an advantage. I watched an interview some time back where Derrida was asked, if you are to watch a biography of uh, Heidegger or Hegel, what would you want to hear them say? And uh, he said that I would want to hear them talk about their sexuality. Why is it that they don't talk about their private lives? Why is it that most philosophers only tell us the serious in quotes, the serious stuff, but they don't tell us anything personal? Not all of them. I think some have, have done so. And Derrida himself tried to do that. The interviewer returned the question to him. Would you be comfortable if I asked you that question? And he dodged it. Uh, he, it seems he wasn't ready to talk about the same thing that he expected others to talk about. The reason I talk, I mentioned this, uh, Casatella's work helps us a lot methodically or in terms of contextualizing uh, Derrida by giving us some biography, by helping those who might not know a bit of who Derrida was, a bit of uh, his cultural background, a bit of his appreciations and misappreciations, uh, his reading and misreading. And I think that is always important in understanding an author. Uh, was it Joseph who said that uh, it might not be appropriate to try to know so much about the author because you're supposed to look at the text, but not the author. 
I might not particularly agree with that. Every author writes from within a context and their background is always there either in the foreground or in the background of their work. It facilitates your understanding of what they wrote if you know a bit more about them. Which is where I wanted to ask, uh, because Kasatela has been nodding, why is it that in the book you tell us so little about yourself? <laughs> yeah, for those who might not know Kasatela, Serenba starts with telling us a bit in the two years. Um, uh, Silvana also told us much about Kasatela and uh, the length of time he has known him, the kind of person he is. And I think it helps them to understand what he writes better. I was at the mercy mostly of the acknowledgement. Because while I know Kasatela, but I don't know much about him, we have only uh, related casually at a few events. So I think this book could have been helped. Of course, you don't have all the space to say so much about yourself. And I understand some people are a bit hesitant to talk about themselves. It's a difficult thing. Uh, was it David Hume in his, uh, he, David Hume wrote an autobiography of 15 pages. And he starts by saying, I'll be brief because it's not easy to talk about yourself without uh, sounding to be engaging in vanity. Yeah, perhaps that could be the reason why <laughs> Kazatela could also have been reluctant, but you mentioned your uh, family in Palestine, your time in Palestine, and I was trying to use that those little bits to, uh, to ask, where is Kasatela coming from to write this? Everyone comes from a particular background to say or write what they are saying. As Seremba was speaking, I was asking, where is Seremba coming from? <laughs> and I was waiting partic particularly for him to end his talk without mentioning a certain name. <laughs> because if he didn't, I would say that is not Seremba. <laughs> or something has happened to him. But it helps to contextualize what he's saying. And even for him to mention the seven years, seven long years. Yeah, that means a lot. Um, Seremba, I didn't come for you. <laughs> That's just by the way. Yeah, so uh, Kasatela, you could mention, you could say something about that, why you did not find it important to provide some reflexivity, tell us a little more, telling us a little more about you, the author. My reflections are a bit random because there are many things that I crossed out. Uh, so it might not really flow from one point to the other. Now to the topic of the book, the title, Uh, you choose to call it, um, to use theological political and not religious political. Yes, I understand you say that you adopt the term from, uh, uh, from yeah, Spinoza. But I don't really understand from the reading of the text why you don't use religious. Yet in the text itself, it appears theological and religious are used interchangeably as though they are synonymous in certain areas. I appreciate your critique of uh, religion and its background, where it comes from, its historicity. But if that was the case, if that was the problem, then even within the text, it would have been used reservedly and not interchangeably with uh, theological. And on the note of the historicity of language, of words, of whatever the text that we are dealing with, I tend to think that that might not always be a problem because every text, every word, every language has that historicity, but it depends on what you do with it. There are certain words that have negative historical origins, but we, which we have sanitized and appropriated to use them differently. For instance, in Uganda, the word tribe is now almost innocent. But if you mention the word tribe elsewhere, if you know it's anthropological uh, history, many people will be uncomfortable with it. So should we say that we should abandon the word, the use of the word tribe in Uganda, the way we do, leave alone the other connotations that come with uh, um, the practices that are created out of its usage. So even religion, I think quite innocently about its origins. 
and maybe even not caring to know where it comes from. So that could be a problem depending on how you think about it, but not necessarily so. You explain that uh, for Derrida, the theological and the political are interrelated and yet distinct, um, distinct since first inception. Thus, they cannot be separated as in traditional conceptualizations of secularism or collapsed into one another as in forms of critical messianism or religious fundamentalism. Uh, what I perhaps need to understand better is where you say that they cannot be separated. Is this cannot a universal? Is it used here normatively that we should not, or it's an impossibility in terms of what we can do or not? Because I understand that in certain contexts, this can be possible uh, to separate them. So what exactly is meant here? The impossibility, is it an ontological impossibility? Is it an a normative impossibility. And if it's ontological, I could have some reservations about, about that. If you, when you read texts like, um, yeah, that um, famous or infamous book by Mbiti, African Religions and Philosophy, where he says, starts by saying that Africans are notoriously religious. How do we read that in the context of this? Is this a collapsing of uh, the so many things about Africans, the political, everything into uh, being religious? Or is it just an explanation of an um, existential setting where people find or see religion, sort of a pantheism in everything? Is it a possibility or an impossibility? Should we be keen on context? You say that it is typical of modern, the modern paradigm, especially in reference to exclusion of sexual difference and the view of democracy as sovereignty, um, racialized and masculine. And I want to understand here what you mean by the modern paradigm. Do we have a one modern paradigm? What is that? You mentioned here and there a bit of its idiosyncratic element. But do we have a particular modern paradigm that we can point us to say that when you see this, this, and this, that is modern? And if it's there, where can we locate it? Uh, even geographically, because this is often attributed to the West, which West is quite diverse, um, even if it's in reference to this particular, to the particular understanding of. Uh, of the secular or secularism. I'm trying to check through what I have crossed or what remained. But there is always, um, you don't mention it very explicitly that you're using a deconstruct deconstructivist methodology, even if you're relying on Derrida, because I think Derrida is not only deconstruction. But we can see a bit of deconstruction in the background. Now, the challenge I find, and which has mentioned, been mentioned by a number of critics with the constructivist, um, the deconstructivist frame, is that one at the same time dislocates what they seek to explain. So when you dislocate it, how do you explain what you have already dislocated? Which I see with the. Uh, Derrida's explanation of Islam and the difficult of even understanding what Islam is of Deen and the so many other concepts that you deal with in the book. So with the deconstruction, you always have this uneasy feeling that you appreciate what it's trying to do, but you have the anxiety because you don't know where it's going. And coming from an ethical orientation, I have that fear because I'm asking, okay, Yes, we are deconstructing, we are going this direction, but where are we going to end up uh, in a normative sense? I understand that this could be an irrelevant question being asked in the context of Derrida's work, but it's quite relevant trying to think that all this theorization are coming up with method is ultimately meant to address issues that we are grappling with, which the book starts with the problems of uh, intolerance, um, 
fundamentalism and all that. So if we deconstruct, and if let's say we manage to dislocate secularism, do we need an alternative? Do we need um, another kind of arrangement or order that we suggest? Or as Derrida says, we don't always have to worry about a solution. The complexity itself can be satisfactory. Of course, I understand that it could be said that my the problem I'm raising speaks to my teleological thinking, which I don't deny, but I only acknowledge that or want to say that it's necessary. As I come to the end, I promise to be very brief. I'm told that the longest speech started with, I will be very brief, but I mean it, I'll be very brief. Yeah, when you, the book is titled very broadly, Beyond the Secular, is the secular one. I think you talk about it uh, brief, even uh, at the beginning, you talked about it. Uh, if we know that the understandings of secular, uh, the secular or the secular society, secular state and all that, that there are so many interpretations are not necessarily interpretations rooted in that binary that you talk about where the secular is explained to be and the rest the theological theocratic faith and of course that ordering the hierarchical inferiorization of faith can't we think of the secular outside that or maybe you simply wanted to pick it to speak to a particular understanding of uh, uh, the secular, the one of uh, of Derrida that you try to explain, but the book seems to give an impression that it's about all the secular. I happen to have attended the launch of this book 12 years ago, which you cite in your own book, Islam and the Secular State by Anaim. Uh, Anaim's understanding of the secular state Oh, the subtitle is Negoci Negotiating the Future of Sharia. At the opening of the book, Anaim says, in order to be a Muslim by conviction and free choice, which is the only way one can be a Muslim, I need a secular state. By secular state, I mean one that is neutral regarding religious doctrine, one that does not claim or pretend to enforce Sharia, the religious law of Islam, simply because compliance with Sharia cannot be coerced by fear of state institutions or faked to appease their officials. This is what I mean by secularism in this book, namely a secular state that facilitates the possibility of religious piety out of honest conviction. Now it sounds that Anaim is trying to run from the problem you seem to see in the secular. For Anaim, the idea is that within the secular, there is enough freedom for everyone to choose the kind of affiliation they want or the way of worship that they uh, choose. Uh, but you're saying in the book that even where there is this semblance of choice, the secular itself is facilitated or framed within a particular ideal that is grounded in a religious history, mostly a Christian history, or it would even be an Islamic history. Now, if that be the case, would we then say that since the framing is grounded in that history, then it's better without it? And beyond the secular state where the book tries to take us, what is there? I'm not saying that there is nothing. There is, but do we need to ask that question, what is there? especially in terms of how we can alternatively arrange society. And I ask this because I understand that we came to the secular because we are running from a problem. And part of that problem was in the arrangement that Derrida suggests. So when we try to go back to that order or disorder or whatever you may call it, how do we address the challenges that it raises practically? So in conclusion, Derrida is quite interesting, both as an analytical 
Hey, and in terms of what we can practically draw out. But you always get this feeling at the end that you have done so much, but you're left with nothing, or you're left with something unstable. You're left with something that leaves you in anxiety, which is the anxiety I see outside secularism. I don't know whether that is a, a phobia that we are just used to this order that we don't want to imagine of a different order. But all that said, I really congratulate you, uh, Andrea, and I thank you for inviting me to this conversation for healing my phobia of Derrida to a certain extent. And uh, yes, I, I, oh, I didn't historicize. Yeah, which is another thing I have to appreciate. It's one of the first times I come here without feeling that I have the obligation to, to historicize. Thank you so much. <laughs> We thank uh, Professor Jimmy Spoyer Sentongo. Um, I would like to invite uh, Uta Kasatela uh, come and make sense of these comments in a few minutes. And then we shall open up uh, the discussion to the audience. Um, if you want to say something, kindly prepare your question or comment briefly and concisely because of the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, the discussant, for the uh, the passion, the intensity, the friendship, the love, and the richness of the comments. I I I, I take them really uh, as gifts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me try to, I can't address all of them in, in, in a way, so I'll try to address what I think are maybe the most contentious or what I consider the most contentious, uh, um, in, including some clarification. So I'll, I'll, I'll do it chronological order so that, that this might be easier according to who has presented what. So very quickly in thinking about I mean, the reason why I mobilize the question of biography, I, I think that particularly for a, 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 colonial, a colonial or colonized subject, the question of the lived experience might be different from the question of the white masks. And so the experience, uh, the lived experience does something or offers something in terms of resources that one can tap into in order to, 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 to relate differently from the imposed white masks. And I, I also uh, I share the idea that there is, first of all, who, what is a text? Is the text what an author writes or what also people read and interpret the meaning of? So is meaning just within the text or is in between mm -hmm. the reader and the producer? So I, I, I'm not separating those two categories. And so is the reader producing us some sort of other universalism? So I want to clarify this. I think what, what I found attractive and convincing in his approach of exemplarity is this one that uh, 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 as, a, as a particular human being, you are characterized by whatever uh, conf uh, uh, context and you reflect from it and you never leave, leave it. Uh, 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 um, stay, right? you don't fly from, from the particular to the universal and then you do the traditional uh, operation that you deploy the universal as well for all and you forget, you forgot it from where you started. And so this idea of, of uh, 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 you, what I, I articulate as universal value without universal validity is not one universalism. In fact, it's the possibility of connecting different point of view and that could be different universalism. But the point is the vigilance on it is that the universalism doesn't become a universalization. And so it's always a limited in the possibility of including others. Right? And so it cannot be one universal. That would be the, the, the death of it uh, as, as an alternative form of thinking. So uh, uh, I'd like to say something to Silvana, but uh, 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 mostly in terms of uh, 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 thanking her for the testimony she gave us. We didn't agree on anything she said. <laughs> and of course we are friends, but she went quite, quite intimate. And so uh, 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 I'm glad she picked my 
maybe flirting with Nietzsche, but Nietzsche was a poet as well. And his writing is Purim, but he's also aphoristic. And so I think that the, 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 the performance and the affirm affirmation of it, I think, I hope it, it comes through the, uh, uh, the, these pages. So, um, Jacob, I, I, I responded, I think, to the question of one universality. Is the secular homogeneous? No. And here there's a, there's a question, there's one secular. But is the modern state homogeneous? No one. I mean, I'm thinking uh, along this similar line. What is the logic of the secular? Right? And then, of course, in its historical instantiation, it takes different forms and adapts itself in different ways. But as, as I understand, it was conceived to be part of the modern state. There was no possibility of funding the law on a sacred text or on metaphysical thinking or, or we call it indigenous knowledge, right? And that was because the foundation of it is based on reason that is continued between, you know, there's a continuity between science and that understanding of modern philosophy that they think that validity and knowledge is firstly established by reason as removed from myth, illusions, uh, a faith that are conflated uh, uh, within each other. So, of course, there are multiple seculars, but I think the logic goes back to uh, 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 one. So, uh, insofar as the uh, uh, um, uh, um, I don't think that the, when I said there is no outside secular, I don't think that the, uh, because the secular is, is, is all encompassing, but I don't think it's totalizing. So, there are there are, there, of course, there are differences in form of resistance within. And the resistance is in, in, in terms of what I was try, trying to mobilize is that, with the example of Islam, is that it has not capitulated to secularization. And it's not the only example. I was making one example. Okay, so I think the possibility of resistance is internal. The point is, is legibility. And it, it, the, the possibility of, of bringing to the surface, given the fact that, that there is a, a being caught in between the modern and whatever was preceding it. And that, I understand that as, 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 a, as a question of translation. You don't translate whatever preceded it into the modern simply or retranslate it back into the nothing. The question is, uh, uh, if there is an equality of language so that there is no meta language, the battle is on how do we determine the object of analysis and according to which concern, understanding, values, and frameworks. And so that is, I think, an operation that is very political and that there's no guarantee that you've done it. You, you, you caught it. Okay. So, uh, um, um, so in terms of uh, 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 the, the question of on the, on the language of of, 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 of of promise and what would be the customary compared to the language of promise, the language of promise is is uh, I think a, a provocation of thinking about how can we think about difference without uh, 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 refraining from the anxiety. Uh, uh, Jimmy was talking about, and the anxiety is what? What? What is the source of anxiety? What? What guarantees the source of anxiety? Isn't faith a response to the source of anxiety? Is it? Is it part of the human condition, or is it part of something else? It seems to me that the 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 the, the modern response, particularly in Europe, and then exported, was an, an attempt, was a replacing the you know reason has replaced theology, but giving a univocal understanding of what truth is. And, 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 and that it was a way to respond to the, the problem of fundamental pluralism. That there are very different ways to respond to, to the, the question of human existence. And so I'm not sure whether one should, should, should you know, Derrida says we have to conjure specters. These are things that I haven't talked about. He has a book called Specters of Marx. And specters for him are also ancestors, are traces of the past that are, are there, not visible, but they are there, are traces of the past that are visible and there. So it is a, a, a conjuring specter is the idea that whatever is uh, recognizing the present uh, uh, is not all there is, first of all, and has been there because there have been certain exclusion. And so the battle here is you may stabilize certain element in order to focus on others. And that, that, that's what Derrida has done. He has focused on certain element in order to destabilize others that I believe he thought they were uh, 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 of, of, of political urgency. But I don't think that there is the excluded that one could pick as the model of the excluded that should be privileged. I think it's a contextual uh, response and question of which element of the excluded are you going to uh, uh, mobilize um, or focus on. Uh, um, so uh, I, 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 I hope I can engage in, in a longer response, but I want to address somehow uh, what has been said. So uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. 
I take also your your, your intervention as, as a form of love. <laughs> See, no, I'm serious about it, and and uh, 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 and yes, my 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 critique of Meiser uh, in terms of, of culture is in terms of it, which is a critique not simply of Meiser, but I, I think the understanding of this interdisciplinarity, or perhaps of the very structure of how do we think of interdisciplinarity. If interdisciplinarity is that we cross different fields and then we are interdisciplinary, but methodologically we stay within one discipline, how are we within the interdisciplinarity? And so the reason why I think that here translation is very important because translation as the critical resource that I, I use from Derrida is that it pushes away from the possibility of going back to a master signifier or a master response. So example, what 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 is the most, uh, 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 one could say you study land. Well, you're doing political economy. No, no, I'm doing cultural studies. You see what I'm saying? That if, if you want to study land, the, 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 the fundamental understanding, you have to have a sense of its objective aspect, the material aspect. And so this is also intrinsic to Mar Marxism, that eventually Mar Marxism had an ontology. The ontology was that you can reduce the understanding of reality to labor and material relationship. But labor and material relationship are also interpreted through theory. And so, there is an interplay between the historical and the material, the theoretical and the material, and the cultural. And so what I'm trying to say is that one risk of seeing the cultural as derivative is that we, we, are, we are left with little sources to think also how the culture is, is in some sense, in that dialectical relationship. And my, my uh, 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 resistance on the question of Re retrieving what the customary is, is not that we retrieve the customary, but So when you move away and you look back, that is the movement of the messianic in Benjamin Adorno, at this piece of Latino. You imagine a point into the future. When you look back, you are able to clear here, you can't see all, all those objects. But when you're here, you look back, you say, oh, there were more objects. So that is, that is the, somehow the trick that I think has, has some, some, some uh, methodological uh, uh, value. Uh, uh, um, on, on, on the question of, of Islam and the Islamic case, I, I, my, my, maybe uh, I think you, you spot something important that I, I should have been more careful. My idea of the Islamic case was, was not simply because, you know, I go on and on and on and saying that the, the, the proximity that I see between what Derrida is doing, what Islam as a framework, as a, as a, 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 for thinking, socialize differently. There is a proximity in the resistance of separating the theological from the political and don't, it, there is a resistance on any form of separation. And that is the, the anti-racial push that I see. And so uh, 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 when I was referring to, to, to the Islamic it was in my mind was mostly to uh, thinking about spaces where there, were, there, were, there was pluralism within, within. So majority Muslim, but not necessarily uh, uh, all Muslim. Um, uh, and of course, you know, I think you know, I'm very aware that the binary between religion and culture is, is I mean, the book can't sustain maintaining that, that binary uh, uh, in itself. Uh, uh, um, um, so, uh, uh, um, yes, there is, so my, my sense, and then, you know, I, I, I wrote a chapter at the Center for Contemporary Islam in the University of Cape Town, and I had similar reaction uh, 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 with regard to how can you say that this is uh, proximus to, to Islam when there is no engagement to text or, 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 or thinkers? And my sense is that uh, Algeria was a majority Muslim culture. All the people surrounded the area were, were Muslim. Is there something about the lived experience that is difficult to render in language, but that informs the way we articulate things without nevertheless confronting them or practicing them. And some people have said that uh, uh, some, some of those readers, I think that is close to Ibn Arabi or that is close to some Muslim mystics. Uh, 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 so I, I think that 
if we pay attention to the context from which it comes from, which doesn't determine what it does, but it fundamentally condition it. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't think that we can think of Derrida as a thinker that is not connected to Islam, whatever we, we, we think Islam means. So, uh, um, um, yes, the, uh, uh, um, I, I'm really with you, uh, Jimmy. Who, who am I writing for? Who was I writing for? Now, this, this, and so that I'll bring in some, some uh, biography here. So uh, 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 for many years, you know, I have a, I have a background on my, my mother's side from the former Yugoslavia. Now, former Yugoslavia was not a colonial place, but when you have a genocide, there is a colonial logic, right? And the forces are happening there. And so for me, understanding what, what, what is identity, because they were manipulated for, 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 for so long time, each and all of them, uh, was a, a, a retrieving element of traces. And I found in Derrida by accident, I found Derrida by accident speaking about those things. And particularly I found convincing and powerful the idea that he was resisting, reducing his identity to one. Faith is a, is a mode of making uh, a cognitive about the world. Okay, so faith in, of course, is not a question of knowledge. Really that is something like this, okay? So, and also sharing with other thinkers also delivers the issue that the they have acknowledged that maybe the sources of the United States from the are not simply for the reason alone uh, in any version. And so this this this, this uh, 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 possibility of separating them requires a stepping outside that is a fantasy. That it's where, where do you go when you do that? And how do you tease out what is what and how what is what became to be what? Right. So I'm playing a little bit with it, but I'm trying, I'm trying to, make to make a point. point of you know, uh, 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 the difficulty in fact, fact of doing, doing so, so unless, unless you. you you presuppose that you, you, you have a, 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 a capacity, capacity. A, 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 a. language and, 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 and cognition allows you to, 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 be, to, to grasp the, 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 the two, two transparently the, the two that you're using, using while you're using them. As if the language and you the thought of the form are not informed by uh, uh, elements of history. So in, in this, I, I, I agree with Wittgenstein, I, I agree with others, but also the mystics, that the idea that yours, it's language that speaks you rather than you speaking a language. And that is why also writing a text is not a complete question of intentionality to respond to, 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 to Yosef. Uh, uh, um, um, let me, uh, 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 la last things about uh, uh, decolonization, the future of decolonization of being I don't think that, I hope I have it conveyed at least in the book that uh, Derrida is against the future. Derrida is both for the past and the future, for rethinking how we relate to both the past and the future. And the idea is that the, 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 the problem he had with it is that if you comport yourself in the future by thinking that what you've grasped in the present is the way to go, right? In the sense that you are normative from the present before negotiating, through what happens, then the risk is that you have you, you impose from the present. And the present is, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, dictated by certain forces, both the discursive level, political, military, and economic level. And so uh, uh, the idea is that if you comport yourself in the future in this way, you risk to never encounter difference. What you encounter is your translation of difference. And if you happen to be on the side of defense with power, what 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 you do is a sort of a, a, a assimilation. 
Now, to speak of, of the, uh, uh, a, simulatory, a, a simulatory part, I understand in, uh, that, of course, not everything has been assimilated. And by saying also, my, my chapter on, on, on Islam points to that. But uh, the, the point, the point uh, that I, I'm trying to, to was, I was trying to make with, with regard to this assimilation is that the framework from which, not simply the framework, the theoretical framework, but also the concrete condition from which we interpret the present and the past is fundamentally marked by the secular, by the modern. And so, it, it, uh, and it is, we have to undo it while we're doing it. That is a fundamental thing. And in that sense, I, I, I thought of assimilation uh, uh, insofar as we still, in my, in my understanding, uh, uh, do, do, do not really know how to do it. In a way that, in, in a way that doesn't, doesn't uh, replicate or risk to replicate. Uh, 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 return to essences, to, to, to frozen identities. And the, the anxiety that this provoke, and that is also the, the response that Derrida received all over the places is that, well, what politics come out of it? Uh, what, what hope for decolonization? I think Derrida is his own limit also. Of course, you know, I moved away also from Derrida, but I, I think that at, at the theoretical level, but also for practical life or thinking about how you, you think of your own identity is not simply, uh, uh, what is the difference within you that makes you closer to others that are so different from you? And so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very different way, I think, to relate to, to identity. Have, therefore, the importance of how we negotiate culture in order to, uh, 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 culture and our uh, own identity, in order to do anything at all, because these things are like puppeteers that they work from behind, and we we, we don't we don't realize it why why we're deploying them. I think I stopped here. Thank you. We have come to the last session of the seminar. Uh, members in the virtual audience. Uh, register your comments or questions on the board and we shall have them let's take a few questions be concise and precise we we'll begin with david kakaire and tosin olimolade and caroline thank you thank you very much i i don't have a question as well as the comment like that um, about the fact that um, Andrea, uh, there are six pages in the bibliography of the reader's text. For uh, <laughs> 12 times New Roma, six pages on the B4 format. This is a considerable amount of uh, dedication to the reader. I think there's, and uh, we are missing this kind of scholarship. I mean, putting up with the text has to go all the way. I never knew how. Prolific was up until I came up with this picture. I really want to thank you for that. And uh, to thank you also repeatedly for the fact that you can actually welcome this book and finish it up without having Mahmoud Bandai in the bibliography. And you can have your lunch. And and <laughs> Does Mahmoud have any very in his writings? Well, I mean, there is, there is a way in which Mandana here has been writing, but but again, it's with Mahmoud Saba and, 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 and get off the hook. Castella should get off the hook. But I have a point about uh, the comment that came into the discussion regarding uh, what, I mean, what the reader, the reader has been doing in his scholarship in terms of uh, uh, engaging with uh, Western thought. Uh, uh, from, from the margin, the margin. and, and recuperate the reader of the, the margin and the cases as, as an intellectual resource for decolonization, and particularly the the, the impasse, the epistemic impasse that the decolonial school currently is undergoing, and, going. and, and you, you you recuperate it from those margin, and and avail the reader to us as an important resource to help us from the south 
the biggest margin in today's uh, uh, knowledge production, to think with the reader as also a decolonial scholar from the South, and so on and so forth, um, which is great. But I think the, your bibliography also suffers from some critical engagement with uh, some of those uh, 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 important voices. The reader did not perhaps have access to given geographical uh, obsession with the debate he was intervening in, which you now have access to. Um, Poleo Tuji just died uh, a few weeks a few weeks ago, actually. Poleo Tuji, a very important uh, Beninua thinker who was, uh, for a better part of his life, about 40 years of scholarship on the question of really of culture, the political culture and, and history. And uh, he has some uh, interesting uh, engagement with, uh, um, you know, this complex. He doesn't call it the theological political complex, but at least he calls it the cultural political complex. And, and in it, there is religion there. Um, Emmanuel Katongole uh, wrote a book uh, a decade ago, uh, two decades ago now, uh, titled Beyond Universal Reason, um, um, Ethics and Religious Complex, if I may paraphrase it. Um, it does with uh, uh, Stanley Howard what you do with the reader. Um, Katongole goes on to become uh, a political Theolog uh, a political theologian and 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 he has interesting things to 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 come back to your arguments and you you are not engaging with them uh folks like uh, uh Jimmy talked about Midi uh who are uh, first generation scholars of uh, African thoughts and engagement but beyond BD and Templates and uh and uh, and um and that first generation there's a current generation of scholars which I think will be an important indicator to really say the reader is indeed within the theoretical frame, within the interlocutors who are from the global south. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Kasule. Thank you, Professor Kasatela, for the for the book. Uh, main, I have uh, two comments and one question. Uh, the first comment is about uh, is about uh, the the conversation that has happened this afternoon has remain, reminded me of a discussion we had with Professor Taiwo of how, how do you avoid getting closed up? I, because it has a tendency of diminishing your intellectual imagination. And uh, I, I think uh, for all of us, we, 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 we may pay hope. produced by conditions. And I think the engagements we are having in most of these conversations is to know those conditions. Uh, which takes me to the second comment about our obsession with the Jewish thinkers. Each, all of these, starting from Marx, the reader, whichever we, we can speak of, uh, most of uh, what we are calling post-colonial thinking and uh, uh, liberation struggles have been largely shaped by the Jewish thinkers. Be aware of those things and know what are the limitations of this particular abstraction? To what extent does it speak to my conditioning? And, and I think that should be the starting point, which requires intellectual humility. Because I've seen even the Deridian, the deconstructionist, they have a tendency to dismiss Marxism as mere specters. But for another person, I don't know whether capitalism is mere specters, it's a mere ghost. If you were in a, in a condition we are in today, or after seeing the great crunch of 2008, would the reader write the same way what he writes in specters of uh, Marxism? I, 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 I believe may be differently. Uh, whether it's Foucault, when he's writing, society must be defended and other texts where he's having an engagement with Marx, he would write differently. So the question of time for whoever is receiving these wisdoms, because we should not just be mere, mere set-top boxes that you just take it like, this is how it should go. Uh, and and this, this makes me think that uh, even what you're calling us to do, to engage with the reader, 
within post-colonial studies, I've seen gra subject colonialism by Desai is engaging with the reader. Mary Pratt's project 1992 is not so much clear on deconstruction, but is, that is the, the politics of her writing imperial eyes. Uh, in the even uh, conscripts of modernity by, by David Scott it is more or less a conversation within post-colonial studies. So I, I thank you so much that you're opening this conversation at MISA, that there are many ways we can engage and reflect on decolonization. If we are thinking of a decolonization project without completely dismissing it, there are ways we can think of a decolonial future beyond perhaps that has been ordained to us uh, or which we've been culturalized into. Uh, and I think that is, uh, that is critical. So my question to you, Prof, is if deconstruction imagines a project that is egalitarian and, and, and to quote uh, Silv, I, I don't know the names, uh, the professor who was online, I was saying that openness to difference and the politics, eventually the politics of cosmopolitanism that Jacob referenced as thinking of the universalism that is beyond a particular imagined as a universal. Would you imagine it without looking at particular struct forms of structures that form your present? Like for instance, Marxism, uh, no, 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 capitalism, as imagined by Marxism, then you, you come to think of colonialism as the, the post-colonial studies scholarship as illustrated. Would you completely imagine that egalitarian society by telling us, let's deconstruct and go backward in history and forget about this? Why am I saying this? Many, many thinkers have put, uh, to have illuminated and I think those who are just engaging with uh, deconstruction, to understand it well, you can read Raymond William, you can read uh, Stuart Wall, they, they put shape to his. All these thinkers have not completely dismissed the structures of capitalism and colonialism. They may treat them as marginal based on the circumstances they are in, but they have not treated them as marginal. Now, you who is writing in this context today, in Uganda, Senegal, Palestine, and you've lived the conditions. Should we say we should imagine a future, a politics of difference without looking about this historical injustice? And if we imagine that, are we not conforming to a theory of justice by John Ross? Okay, thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, the book actually allows a lot of points of curiosity for me. Because my first book was really intrigued by your mental interpretation. Um, because you um, I do not get the sense that I get the sense that um, you're really doing a textual interpretation in a way that brackets context. So I, I, I wonder if you could speak a little more about uh, your mental interpretation. Then, um, why do you prefer to use theological politics rather than political theology? What's the difference between the two? Um, thank you both for the book. Um, I, I hear, I think that theological political question um, tends to address the issue of sovereignty because that is like the underlying force around it all. That sort of leads us to think about secularism as like the normative trait that should make the state be at the center of this whole. But then we know that the state is still reproduces religions or even at worst the belief at, at, at uh, the belief, right? The belief system at worst as, as a form of a religion within the very state. So my, my question then is um, can we can we imagine a society like that of Bourgeois? Or what 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 would you think about 
a society, we're trying to think about sovereignty, which I think is the underlying question within the secular and religious debate. Mm -hmm. Much into uh, for at all, it looks into historical examples, democratic or something, but not engaged, not going to the field of technology. So, and uh, 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 I don't think that this is something also that I part of the that I'm dealing with, but it's not, uh, uh, um, there's no move, move away, away from, from concrete, concrete structures. structures, there's no, no move away from concrete, concrete structures. Uh, uh, and I I I, um, I highlighted at the very beginning of the of the book that uh, materialism material elements like such such as the market and colonialism as a form of exploitation are are key to the form of discourse that has been articulated. So there's no moving away from from, from the materiality. The point is how do we understand the materiality in the first place? And so, so that's, that's what, what I was trying to utilize how we, we, we connect the material to the understanding of the material. The material is not the idea of the material is not material. And so that is the problem the problem of all of it. So that's when culture and, and, and the politics come 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 into effect. Uh, 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 and the, the book, just to be precise, the, the perspectives of Marx is not about the idea that Marxism is perspective. It's a spectacle, a spectacle for Europe, but the idea that in the foundation of uh, uh, any system, and he plays Marx, I mean, he goes with Marx, uh, there are fundamentalist exclusions. So when we think of justice, any normal justice that we use at present is the product of exclusions. So justice is always postponed. Because the normative framework, the normative and ecological framework from which you work is the product of exclusions. And, and that, that is, is a sort of a, 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 it's a, 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 a description of the mechanic of, 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 of the function, I would say. So, so uh, um, the, the engagement with, with, uh, 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 with context. context. So, so there's, there's, a, there's, there's a big, big engagement, engagement with context to, to, to mention what is, is the context of reference for Derrida in terms of. What, what were, were the forces and the, and the complication and the complexity happening in Algeria at that time? So, so is a minority subject, 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 subject that is posed in the position of, of the colonizers and their citizenship, citizenship against Berbers and, 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 and the Arab populations. Uh, so, so it is, it is, it is completely shifting according to typical colonial powers of the time. But, but at, at the same, same time, time it's, 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 it's cut into uh, 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 the pulling apart of so many identities as a concentration of other places, as a concentration, a concentration of so many multiple identities. What, what do they do and allows us to think about in terms of how do we think reality? When, when we tap from, from different, different identities, identities that have different cultural sources, that they, that they name the object they look at in different ways. How do we navigate them? And I, thought that, and I thought I that, 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 I think it was a point from the Kaira as well. Uh, 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 I, I think that, that is, 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 is interesting in this question of translation, is interesting in the question of origins, interesting in the question of specters. It's something that doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. It's part of the context of where it's from. Whether we want to enter a debate, whether that is African or not, we can enter in that debate, but. What, what, what I'm trying to say is, is, is a thinker like like like, like, like Anon, Anon that has concentrated the sources and the reaction to sources are all Western. But as he spoken while he spoke, while he spoke in, in the language of the colonizer, as he spoke, spoke in, the in the language of the colonizer. Hmm. The reason why I, 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 I resist a little bit on the use of political theology is that because in modern time political theology is a is a is a discourse that has been revitalized very much by Schmidt, the responses to Schmidt. And in unlike in Primon, if you think of Augustine, if you think of also Muslim thinkers, right? Uh, 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 the idea of using uh, political theology is a sense in which the theology is defined, in one defines the other. And theological political one really maintain 
this element of relationality, right? And so this is this is uh, you know uh, it's both a theoretical move and a performative move on my side to say that this 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 hyphenation is fundamental as an entry point because it, the way you want it is already relational. Uh, Carly, your, your question, I was, so you, you were saying that, that repeat, repeat the question, sorry. Okay, my question is, uh, how do we think so brain or how do we think so brain? Sorry, thank so, you. So, if, if, if it is done from a theoretical, theoretical point of view, the idea of sovereignty that is, is problematic is the idea that there is a, there is a conception of selfhood that is undifferentiated and indivisible. That and that is, again, is again getting, getting away, away from the relationality of any experience, of any experience that you can be secluded, secluded from others, that, that your identity is self. This, 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 this view comes, comes from, from both the uh, 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 theological tradition, it comes both from the mythic tradition that exists in the West, uh, 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 and the, and the idea, idea that uh, uh, sovereign, sovereign, the sovereignty, sovereignty is indivisible. Now, now, if you didn't even think of modern sovereignty, the people, the people of course, have a shared government. government. But how, how do you think, think of, of the difference of shared powers? powers. But, but each, each of those powers is taught in sovereign forms, and we need to be indivisible. So, the idea of sovereignty is to rethink the very idea of identity and subjectivity. That subjectivity is constituted by plurality. And if the articulation is very false, to, 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 to this phenomenological, uh, 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 that you can say, say you are separated from it. And so, so thinking sovereignty is a thinking of what they then give the core of what we think is human beings, but also what, what is the subject of the community, what the member of the So that if we are not reducible to our individual identity, and then on what ways can we can be a member of the community? Not. And when? when? It's a temporal, temporal question. question. Well, sometimes you're good, sometimes you're good. But, but if this is what you see, it's a, a, in a way, way maybe it's frustrating because it's more of a meta, meta, meta reflection. On the truth of the view, when you think about this issue, rather than giving a plan of a picture or a blueprint of how we decolonize. But I do think that this discourse on translation. And, and on the question of origins, origins uh, uh, on the, the critique of religion, are, are fundamental uh, elements, elements for thinking about the colonization. Uh, 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 interpretation. So, so I, 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 I try, try to play that is not the against itself. Uh, and, and that's, that's why, why I try to push elements, elements that maybe he wouldn't have, have uh, 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 um, uh, uh, agreed uh, on. But the idea here is that. When you reconstruct context, the, diff the difficulty of reconstructing context is that we do it from the present. Mm -hmm. And that the very stability of context is possible because of exclusion. We can pick any, any example anywhere. So let me say that in, in 100 years, Israel is successful. Maybe not anymore. But let's say, let's go back to another example. Uh, uh, the region of Armenia and Turkey, right? If you can reconstruct context in, in a space where that has really been erased, and there are people who have been completely erased, that is the context you go back to from the present. But th does that speak to the context? And so what I'm trying to point to is the, the limitation of going back and reconstruct, reconstruct, reconstructing context. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. I am saying that we have, we have to be aware of what we mobilize as entry point and for which reasons. And that is very fine because I don't believe that the epistemological movement is separate from a political movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was an end up. I don't yeah, know. Um, so, Ivana. Professor uh, Carlo yeah. Tenuto, uh, please ask the question you want to ask. Yeah, I would like to. <laughs> Yes, no, it's a comment and at the same time a question to Andrea. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, I was mentioning this uh, generative plurality and I do believe that the discussion that the book by Andrea um, 
uh, is really provoking something very interesting on my side, being on my own here. I can really reflect on this sort of African resistance to Derrida. Um, let me say that I would have never imagined to ask Andrea why Derrida, because once you get to Derrida, especially from the Western world, it's like a destiny. Um, I'm very glad that Andrea is also exploring Fanon with the same intensity that he has been working on Derrida. Once you are there, let me say, because my whole life has been devoted to deconstruction and to trying to make sense of Derrida. Um, and it's also the, the, the doubt, the, the question why Africa is resisting, Africa, let's say Africa, the continent somehow is resisting to the deconstruction. Uh, I really wonder, Derrida and Andrea in this book, they position themselves, and that's a very important political assumption. You position yourself within the space that has created you. Um, when I said reason exposed to its other, it's a project, it's not even a methodology, it's a position. Once you are there, once you have the tools to open up, to deconstruct, so construct, deconstruct at the same time, what has formed you, then there is no other way. You know, you try to understand. Of the Western episteme so much from within. Yeah, so I really believe that once you are taken in by the process of deconstruction, you can find really a very clear vision of, let's call it the enemy, okay? Um, and I do believe that it's full of precious insights because Derrida, the first side, the first period, the second period, whatever, the more philosophical, the more political, he has been really trying his whole life to tackle as much as he could. So it becomes a risky enterprise because you don't you can't rely on any of the language that has been forming you. And when I say you, I mean we white scholars, but also, you know, the never pure other scholar. So to me, it is really a very essential provocation what Andrea is doing, is letting, and it's not by chance that he's not talking about the sacred or at least not so much. He's talking about the secular, which is within the episteme of the Western world. So this is also probably my question to him. Many women, especially women, one in particular, she's called, she's a Brazilian philosopher. She's called Denise Ferreira da Silva. Uh, most of the black radical uh, African-American uh, study, radical thinking, uh, uh, professes a legacy to the Rida, to the construction. This philosopher, she's actually saying, uh, this is what we can do. We can be within the episteme. We all are within the episteme. We are accepting somehow what is happening in Palestine, not only because we are not heard from power. There is also something within us that is no understanding that what is at stake is the Western episteme there, is the dialectics between the settler and the colonizer and the colonized. So we care 
sometimes even more about the whole system than the question itself in its on its own. So this philosopher is saying we can't be outside it. Maybe we can only claim the end of the world the way we know it. So the whole collapse of knowledge according to the modern uh, Western uh, imposition or whatever. But then she says, I was also um, feeling uh, un trapped somehow. So I know that there is no other space. I know that my only chance is counter signature what you know is there, but I also need to know where to find something different from all that. And I really wonder, because I know that Andrea is already planning different directions of his research, more in terms of art, more in terms of imagination, more in terms of poetry, of cultural counter signature. But, you know, I really would like to know, does it not somehow uh, feel too... Uh, suffocating to be always and already within that system that one feels the necessity, the urgency of deconstruct. Is there a um, breathing need that also takes you and such a heavy, serious, consistent scholarship somehow in a different direction, some sort of effort to find something which is not necessarily so much within the, the appropriating movement of the Western episteme. I don't know if I made sense, but this is a long discussion that we have been having for a long time. I know that Uganda is pushing Andrea to move more in the direction of something of the otherwise. Thank you. Uh, what what can I say is that uh, uh, thank you. It appeared to me to be given without a. Uh, 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 sources uh, um, without a language to talk about it. So it, it has happened that, you know, my family was under settler colonialism and my father was one of the representatives of that settler colonialism. And so when you deal with those forces, at the very basic level of identity, how do you deal with that? Which, which language do you do you, do you use or do you construct or you create in order to deal with it? So I do think that if the given in, uh, in, the, in the spaces, formerly colonized spaces, uh, is uh, this in-betweenness that pushes really tears apart, there's no other way but to confront it. Now, there is a there is a limit there is there is much that the social science can help us to do in terms of understanding, but the, there is a limit of what they can do precisely because the category they use are part and parcel of the problem, and we can use them differently creatively, and that is one option. But it's also about trying to think from conceptual traditions that are different. So one one of the idea of doing this 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 class with Yaya is that. How can we seriously think about decolonization if you don't start thinking from the colonization of other, from other traditions that think about it? If you don't start from their concern, understanding and languages, how can you do that? But that is not, uh, 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 I think it's complementary. You can't just do that because the, the rest keeps circulating and it's there before, it's there much there before you and more deeper in you that I think what, what we, we realize. I think um, we are over.
Um, I don't know if you're clapping for me or for Dr. Oh, Taylor. Not for critiquing myself. So, I would like to close this session of the uh, MISA Wednesday seminar. Uh, this book that uh, Andrea Casatella has produced is provoking. It's provoking because it wants to intervene into the methodological question, but we don't know how far, you know, how deep it goes. And I have had some comments as well, and this is the privilege of the convener. Um, and this is the question that uh, Tosin was asking. Um, how do you as interpreter expand on the limitations or you know, try to fill the gaps in the limitations of, uh, of your principle? Uh, this is a, you know, a difficult question. So what is the beyond in the secular? What is this beyond? Okay, uh, if, if we're talking of this beyond, what is it going to be? Is it, is it normative? And, and these questions I'm asking are not for you to, you know, to, it's just for me thinking about this, this book. Um, what, what is the beyond in the secular? Because when we have it, you know, beginning as it does, uh, you know, on page three and four, talking about the theological political complex, which is performing three important functions. And one of those functions is to highlight that attending to the peculiarity of the current predicament requires rethinking not simply the relationship between the theological and the political, but also uh, how, whence, and from which. How, whence, and from which. And I'm thinking that something is, is forgotten. The who, you know, the who is, is, is kind of, of missing. Because we have to think of the who as a historical subject implicated in the beyond, you know, um, and and so when I look at you know what could be missing in Derrida is in you know the last chapter on Islam, you know, and this is this this would be uh, quite disturbing because as someone who who wants to think of maybe you know. Islam as Deen is coming to be the beyond in the secular, okay? It somehow becomes subsumed into this, uh, what Caroline was thinking of this theoretical political, what Tosin was also saying. How do we, you know, how do you reconcile this subsume, you know, the subsumation in the hyphening, you know, in the hyphening? Uh, so you, you illuminate on this uh, thinking, you know, thinking from and with Islam, you know, this is a very, you know, important articulation. But yet, if we are to ask, what does the metaphysical become for, you know, what does metaphysical transcendence become for, you know, for Derrida, you know, uh, is this something that Cassatella would think in trying to block the limitation that, uh, you know, Derrida has? To think of Islam not as you know not as religion but as as din it's com you know in the complexity and completeness you know so is the beyond a normative space uh, is it a concrete space you know uh, from which we can imagine ways that uh, you know you know uh, prevent this you know this separation of the political from the you know from the uh, from the uh, theological you mentioned in the dis discussion that uh, there is no purity in language. You know, I would like to to disagree with that. What about revelation, for example? Uh, if we think of uh, uh, revelation, you know, as Quran as revelation in the Arabic, you know, uh, the role of the prophet, you know, is to pass the message. The problem of translation and interpretation occurs when the prophet is gone. You know, that's where the problem begins. And so, I see that Derrida is 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 seduced into the. You know, into what uh, you know, into what Jacob was saying. You know, this uh, the interpretation of the sec the secular interpretation of the secular, because he's trying to understand Islam, for example, from the vantage point of enlightening project, which is concerned with uh, this uh, the fixed textual literality. You know, vis-a-vis -vis orality. If we want to, you know, to think of the experiential, and this is very powerful that you introduce this, and this is very very important. This is one of the most important aspects of the book trying to understand how the experiential can become the basis of appreciating, you know, phenomena. And yet, 
the imperative rules by which we experience have been framed by a, a categorical imperative that is written into the Enlightenment project. And so what would Islam give us, for example, to look at Dean as embodiment, okay, the embodied, uh, the everyday, the mundaneness of the political is, for example, calendrical. Uh, you look at the moon, Bekabate, uh, first when the moon comes, and Yan, first when the moon, you know, it, uh, you know, appears. Walilahi muluku samawat wal ard, waktilafi lail wa nahar la ayat, you know, in the alternation of, the, that's how we count time. So, uh, al hayat dunya, we are counting it by our observation, the embodiment of our, you know, our being in the time of the reflection in the movement and the oscillation of, of, of these objects. But then, what is Hayat al, al you know, the Barzakh, you know, in the grave? The grave is still in the dunya, but it's beyond our comprehension. You know, what does time become in the grave, for example? And so, is reason enough to grasp the essence of the phenomena? Um, is reason enough to ground faith? Um, what do we make sense of the obsoleteness of, for example, of, of, of philosophy? Uh, in 1966, Heidegger is, is, is you know, is, is interviewed by, by, by Despego, and he says, only God can save us, you know? Uh, yeah, you know? Uh, no, no, you know, Heidegger, you know? Heidegger. Yeah, Heidegger says, Heidegger. yeah, Heidegger. yeah, Heidegger. yeah, and uh, no, he, he says only a God can save us, you know? Uh, and, and, and he's thinking of uh, the vicissitudes of technology. He's, he's thinking that technology has re replaced, you know, a philosophy. So if human being, that sign, existence, man has fallen into his being, you know, and man as being can't understand himself, you know, what is the point of redemption, okay, uh, in, in, in that sense? And so I want to stop here by commending you on this publication. I think that you're contributing to a very important uh, discussion that is here at MISA and beyond. And uh, I thought that, I think that, uh, you know, we can have much more discussion that are meaningful, be, you know, in here and beyond this space. I would like to join my hands with the rest of the audience to congratulate you on this. And, uh, and uh, we thank you, the audience, for all this time, for being patient with us. Uh, the only way we can reward you is some tea and biscuits and lots of water. Thank you very much.